Hello survivors and welcome to First Aid Spray, a Resident Evil podcast by fans for fans. This is episode 41 and this time we're taking a fully armed guided tour of several biohazard classics and side stories with a look back at 2007's Wii title Resident Evil The Umbrella Chronicles. My name is Sai and joining me on the panel this week and the world will burn in an inferno of motion controls, it's fire button Steve Valance. They said the thing. Hello. <laughs> Completely indestructible in the face of all weapons. Just make sure there's no chandeliers around. It's Moist Owlet, a.k.a. James. James, female spy. <laughs> Follow me. Set me free. Join me and we will escape from Raccoon City. From Serial Box 64, it's Jordan Sugru. Hi, guys. <laughs> This episode of First Aid Spray, like all others, was recorded live in our Discord server. Enter our little world of survival horror now to hear the show early and unedited, as well as join our wonderful community and keep up to date with all of the latest news. You can find a link to the server, as well as all of our other social media profiles, at our website, fasprayPod.com. You can also help the show by checking out our merch or by supporting us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month, with various tiers, each with their own perks. Head over to patreon.com forward slash fasprayPod for a full list and the chance to create bonus first aid spray content. Let's start with housekeeping. As always, uh, Patreon supporters at the tyrant level, that's $5 a month uh, and above, now have access to our musical discussion on Resident Evil Revelations. I told you there were some surprise ones coming. Uh, Steve picked his top 10 tracks from that soundtrack in the latest episode of Now That's What I Call Survival Horror. That is Patreon exclusive uh, for the month of August. So if you want to hear that early, check that out. As well as, of course, everything else that we do uh, is early for patrons. If you're in our Discord server and you're a Tyrant tier backer, you get to see all of our YouTube stuff early as well. Uh, we dropped one this week, so that will be coming out publicly in a week's time. But, you know, patrons get their exclusivity period uh, as they got with 15 cut Resident Evil Monsters, which came out a couple weeks ago. So that's now out on our YouTube, as is our House of the Dead podcast where we talked about the history of that franchise that's now out on youtube and podcast feeds for everyone to enjoy other than that twitch continues with itchy painty this is now the second episode in a row where i've had to say it's got a new start time but hopefully this one sticks you know life comes at you fast and all that uh, but so far so good on this front so uh, adam and burger will be continuing their adventures painting all of the miniatures in resident evil 3 the board game and beyond Every Sunday at 5 p.m. British Summer Time, which is 12 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so adjust for yourself. Uh, yeah, every week moving forward. And finally, uh, just tagging this one on the end, this is probably something that we should have mentioned a couple months ago, and I just completely whoosh, straight over my head that we've had so much going on. Um, but a few of us have had a couple of uh, podcast guest appearances in the last couple of months. So Kelsey has been on the Pixel People podcast recently. Uh, two episodes. It's a podcast with I love the concept where uh, guests come on and, and sort of discuss their favourite NPCs, which is a brilliant idea. Uh, yeah, KDB was on there previously to talk about the boss from Metal Gear, and then on the most recent episode at the time of speaking, there was a roundtable discussion with a theme of redemption, uh, and he reappeared to talk about Annette Birkin from Remake Two. So check that out. That's uh, in the description link to that, as well as. Our appearances on the New to Retro Review podcast. Steve and I uh, turned up on that to talk with our friend Tony, who you'll remember from our Barry Burton special, and of course the Residents of Evil team as well. Um, Steve and I talked about Resident Evil, you know, the community, a bit of first aid spray history. It was a good time. And then I came back for the next one, and Tony and I talked Ghostbusters for about two hours. So that's all in the description if you want to hear more from us outside of first aid spray. So let's move right along with a few headlines from the latest Biohazard News. Our first piece of news then is that Capcom have updated the PC version of Resident Evil Village with issues being resolved regarding DRM. Yeah, this is not something we've talked about much before. Um, I, I don't think many of us have played it on PC other than James, obviously, so you might have a bit of an insight into this. Because I, if I remember rightly, when we did our Village podcast, you talked about a bit of sort of frame dropping and slowdown that you experienced in the game, but I don't know if it was sort of associated with the combat. But yeah, apparently the game was having some slowdown in intense moments, particularly uh, in combat, I think, which seems to be associated with their anti-piracy measures, which has now been 
fixed. It's a it's a weird one. I mean, the game's been out. What are we at? Three months now. Um, so it seems like a strange one. So James, obviously, I don't know if you experienced this or if you've gone back to play Village since this update. Uh, I haven't gone back, but yes, the problems they're talking about. Um, I was I was talking about those problems a lot. We called them. <laughs> I called them the lag flies or the lag bees. Right. Because, yeah. Um, whenever any of the sisters or the sorry the daughters came up to you, and the sisters technically. Um, yeah, you would just get massive frame drops and no other platform was getting it. And it was the same with the werewolves. Um, when they get really close to you, like it was within like the close proximity of you, it would happen. And yeah, I just thought it was just a really bad, <laughs> it was just a really bad uh, like export or something. I don't know, right? Even though it was made for PC. Mm. Yeah, so when... When that came out, it just gave me flashbacks of like five to six years ago of DRM problems happening all the time, and it really should have been identified sooner. But I'm I'm happy that it has been identified, and I do I want to leave Village for a bit before I pop back into of it. Course. But now it's now it's fixed. Like I would have a much smoother experience, even though everybody knows I love that game. Mm. Um, but yeah, it it really did sometimes take away some of the enjoyment because you'd be completely. The immersion will completely break um, for you, but yeah, I'm glad they fixed it. So, oh, sorry. I want to jump in yeah, because I'm Steve, and uh, I've played the PC version since this update, and okay. it's actually done quite a lot. Uh, yeah, the the issues with the flies and stuff, I have had zero of them, and that little stutter you get when you get like a headshot on monsters, tra traditionally like the lichens and whatnot, I have not experienced that either, and that was probably the biggest like holdover of like weird hangups. Mm. It, uh, yeah, hopefully this is going to be a nice groundwork for because they obviously they say they're going to do DLC for it. What, what shape or form that's going to take, it just means that the platform's going to be that much more solid. Um, I think Digital Foundry did a pretty solid breakdown on what's occurred. And yeah. it, the PC version was lagging behind the next-gen consoles was like Series X and PS5, but now it's at least on par, depending on your system. So yeah. all in all... It's pretty good. It's it's weird though because there's been here, there's been stories about DRM in games and how they affect their performance for years. It's why most people get pissed off about it. Mm. And uh, like I remember Doom Eternal going from having really high reviews on Steam to middling because of it, and then going back again when they then re re, re removed Denuvo. So it's it's weird seeing it in reverse. Hopefully yeah. it will bolster its PC um, like fan base a bit because I know that was a divisive implementation. When it was found out, it always yeah. is. So yeah, the 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 headshot thing was also huge because a lot of the time you would, you I mean on PC you're twitch shooting right. So like if you're using a mouse and so if you headshot somebody, you try and move to headshot somebody else, especially in a game that's a survival horror like Villages, like you just can't do it because the game is frozen up and before you know it, like a few frames have gone by and the werewolf is on you or whatever is on right. you. You're facing um, the completely wrong way because it's moved, you know. Kind exactly, of thing, yeah. yeah. It's 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 rough, but yeah. Hopefully that's fixed it. I mean, I have a pretty crappy PC now compared. To, I ju I've just been told by a game that came out last year that my PC is crap. So <laughs> <laughs> it's always a nice message. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm sure it, it'll be fine. I'll, I'll I will probably download it soon, actually, just to see if it does mess mm -hmm. up, and then I'll revisit again in a few months. Yeah, it's it's a it's a funny one. Like, I mean, I'm glad it's been done, but it seems odd that it launched three months ago and we're only just getting this patched out. It just seems a bit strange. Jordan, any thoughts on this? Well, I guess it's just it's it's kind of amazing that there are new different ways that you know DRM, you know, continues to disrupt paying customers' experience. Mm. Um, and it kind of yeah. is counterintuitive to uh, you know what it's trying to be, which is obviously. Uh, a manner of making it so that you know games are not being exploited um especially on pc where you know it could be easier to obtain them through other means but it shouldn't need digital foundry to be reporting on it and obviously other publications it shouldn't need any of this stuff it, it, it should be something that uh, you know capcom themselves and their associates should be looking at and being able to test because what exactly is happening uh, in in the process that's kind of causing these kind of slowdowns, you know, we don't have anything really concrete, um, you know, from from anybody involved. Uh, so it's it's only fair to to kind of ask uh, for you know better explanation, clarity, um, and justification. 
you know, for these systems, mm. if they're going to continue to, uh, you know, hamper experiences, you know, because it's, it's already kind of tricky enough with, with PC gaming to make sure that you have everything optimized, um, uh, you know, when it comes to releases. To have something like this stacked on top with, with DRM complicating things, uh, it's just another additional headache and it's just not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. I. Uh, to add on to that as well, like Choji just said, they're trying to protect from piracy, but those break it anyway. So all it hurts is the actual paying customers. You're right. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, like if somebody's not going to buy the game, they're not going to buy the game. You know, like you can't force that. You can't force them into buying a game by putting DRM on it. Right. Yeah. It's just it, it, I, it makes no sense. And it all, it's always made no sense. You know, so just stop it. Games companies <laughs> stop it because it's just causing hassle for everybody. Yeah. So, our second piece of news, and it's honestly it's groundbreaking. Resident Evil have crossed over into Knives Out. <laughs> yeah, it's almost. I have no idea. Oh yeah, I almost like. There's not much point in talking to this because by the time this podcast comes out, the event will essentially be over. <laughs> 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 it runs, but I wanted to at least, you know, it's been a very slow month and uh, I suppose it is worth talking about it. I mean, most of you guys would have seen the trailer uh, going around on Twitter for this, but nevertheless, um, Knives Out is, you know, not affiliated with the film with the same name. It is a mobile battle royale game, iOS and Android. Um, that's It's done crossovers in the past, or at least a crossover uh, with Neon Genesis and now Resident Evil of all things, you know, the series which apparently, especially this year, the 25th anniversary, just can't help itself sort of having a cheeky collaboration with everybody. Uh, but yeah, the event ran July 29th and, uh, and ends on August the 12th. And uh, yeah, it's just a few cosmetic sort of things, you know, um, a few weapons and character skins, but... That trailer, I mean, it looked, it looked super cool, but it doesn't represent the game. And I don't know, maybe I'm just bringing this up just because personal feeling is they've gone for the whole remake vibe again. They've got the RPD in the trailer. It's RE4, Leon, oddly, and then there's Nemesis in there. And it's just like, it's weird that we just keep getting these crossovers and they're all quite similar. And they're all, I guess, kind of similar to Reverse, the game that's not coming out till next year. Just, it's a weird time. Do you, does anyone agree, Steve? What do you think? It's a weird time for Resident Evil keep seeing these things prop, cropping up or am I just sort of... No, I, I totally agree. I, you know, as much as I'm a fan of RE4, of RE2 and, you know, RE3, like, I, I am sick to the back teeth of seeing the RPD, yeah. Nemesis and Leon Kennedy. I want to see someone else. Yeah, I, I don't care if it's Parker Luciani at this point. Just something a bit different <laughs> from Leon. You know, and, and the RPD and Nemesis. It, it's it's almost, it's becoming routine. And that's mm -hmm. never a good thing. Uh, you know, that's, uh, no. Yeah, exactly that. Like, it makes me think of the Dead by Daylight thing. It makes me think of, I think it was the first season of the show. Quite early on, we were talking about... Um, Player Unknown Battlegrounds Mobile, and it would. They had working on Mr. X. Yeah, exactly, and it yeah, and the RPD. And it's like oh, it just seems to be the thing now, you know. It's just the way it goes. Anyone got any any thoughts on Knives Out X Resident Evil? Uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah, I didn't know anything about this game. Uh, obviously, the news has put my eyes on the game, and will have put uh, many people's eyes on the game. So I'm mm -hmm. sure, uh, you know. Uh, it, it, you know, even kind of a fraction of the Resident Evil fan base even checking it out means that they suddenly know about uh, a property called Knives Out that is not the film, um, that is a, an entirely different game, and they know of it, and you know might might want to play it, even if it's just for the event. Um, so obviously, it is it it is it has done its job in being able to uh, you know promote uh, you know a, a different game and stuff. But that's true. It's it it's. It's kind of begging the question of where, uh, you know, crossover content is right now, what the motive is behind it, mm. and the viability behind it, because, uh, you know, obviously, yeah, we, we love crossover stuff. It's great. Um, but it, it, it's also, when, when it kind of comes around and it's, it's not even really necessarily asked for, uh, it, it kind of obviously smells a little bit like, you know, pure promotion. Mm. Uh, now... I don't think that Resident Evil needs to be necessarily promoted in this fashion. I don't think it's, uh, you know, crucial. I don't think it's necessarily doing a great deal for them. But obviously it does a lot for, uh, you know, the game that they're featuring in. You know, whether it's something like Dead by Daylight or this Knives Out, 
uh, or, or anything else that you know Resident Evil might show up in. And I don't think this is the end of these kind of features. But it's it's uh, you know it's a it's a bit unappetizing because uh, as I say, like not nobody's necessarily asked for this. Mm. You know, it's exciting when you see a crossover happen, and it's between properties that people have been asking for. You know, talking about like you know different fighters and Smash Brothers or Mortal Kombat or something like that. But because this is purely seemingly for you know a promotional purpose. It's, it's another Battle Royale game that no one's really playing. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't necessarily kind of ring in the same kind of fashion. It reminds me of um, uh, when PlayStation All-Stars came out. The, uh, you know, short-lived sort of PlayStation Smash Brothers equivalent. Uh, you know, PlayStation is a, a massive brand, you know, massive consoles, had a lot of games, had a lot of famous faces on those uh, consoles. And when it came to the roster, the roster kind of felt a little bit sort of hamstrung by, uh, you know, a bit of sort of recency bias with mm. uh, a lot of the characters being picked were for either upcoming games or games that had just recently come out that weren't necessarily the face of PlayStation, but more kind of, you know, we can get Bioshock in there or we can get sure. um, we can get the new Dante. Yeah, in, that's exactly what I was you know, thinking as well. Yeah. You know, and... Um, Space 3 yeah, Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Obviously, obviously that is, you know, pure sort of speculation on my front of, you know, the the cynicism that might have gone behind those designs. But that kind of stuff doesn't necessarily sit right with me. And I just mm. wonder if maybe, you know, Capcom are kind of a bit like Sega with uh, you know, Sonic crossovers and Knights crossovers and Super Monkey Ball crossovers. Are they spreading the property a little bit thin? Are they are they kind of maybe uh, offering it out a little too freely, um, and is it going to hit a point of saturation where we're kind of sick of seeing Resident mm. Evil show up in crossovers? I'm not saying this about Smash Brothers, by the way. They can put Resident <laughs> Evil in Smash Brothers, that's fine. But everything else, you know, just like a random uh, game like Knives Out, yeah. you know, is is it kind of like uh, watering down, mm. you know, the brand a little yeah. bit? Yeah, you know what? I think you've hit exactly perhaps what my issue with is you know every time we see this it's obviously less and less exciting no matter the size of the game it's just like oh here we go another crossover with the same stuff and it, it loses its impact of course i think they need to be more experimental they need to be more exciting like where where is resident evil x theme park <laughs> or something you know? two point hospital <laughs> yeah I, um, um, the um, t virus you know <laughs> exactly a, before a they eat your staff a virtual what a virtual theme park, maybe. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, just, you know, we can like sort of cleverly plug here. We put a video out a little while back, five crossovers we'd like to see Resident Evil uh, appear in. I think Steve could have drafted like a hundred options and Knives Out wouldn't have been on there. But go check out that video because that's got some great ideas of where, where we would like the franchise to crop up. Right. Well, let's move on to our main subject for this podcast, which is the Wii and PS3 motion-controlled arcade-style shooter, Resident Evil The Umbrella Chronicles. And now, reading the file Factory Worker's Diary from Resident Evil Survivor, A Wild Banana. August 5th, 1998. I can't stand it anymore. I have to take the subjects to the operating table and sever their skulls to extract a part of their brain. I do this over and over, day after day. It is awful. Guilt stays with me all the time, even after I go to bed. Commander Vincent instructs us, Do not see them as humans. They are just raw material we use to create tyrants with. But it is we who cut their skulls. I can never consider them as just raw materials. They're humans, just like we are. I asked Commander Vincent about ways to reduce their suffering, but he ignored my request, saying that by using anesthetics, pure beta hetero non-serotonin cannot be extracted. Even if it's the company's orders, I don't believe what we're doing is ethical. I'm sure that I'll be sent to the worst possible place when I die. Or perhaps, should I say, I'm already there. So, we have arrived on the Nintendo Wii. Uh, so, this should be an interesting one, because we've not talked about motion controls yet. Uh, if you haven't listened to our House of the Dead podcast, 
maybe that will inform this episode. I don't know yet, but it is quite interesting, of course, that we're following sort of a giant of the genre and then the sort of Resident Evil take on it. So I'm interested to hear opinions um, on how it differs and, and how it compares. In terms of the reaction to the game, uh, which released, as I said, in 2007 for the Wii and then came out for PS3 with the PlayStation Move controllers being used in summer of 2012. Um, yeah, the review's pretty good looking back at them. You know, Game Rankings and Metacritic have them both at 75%. Uh, when it released, Edge and Eurogamer gave it 7 out of 10 for Mitsu, 32 out of 40. Um, Game Revolution gave it a B, 1up.com, B+. So, decent reviews, definitely. Um, it was a an interesting time for the series, obviously, of course, because we're going through sort of a transformation here following Resident Evil 4, but it's, it's nice to revisit some of the classic games and fill in some spots with the lore, which I think is where a lot of people look back at it fondly with some of the sort of side campaigns but we'll we'll sort of go through uh the four chapters when we get there first of course is our initial reaction to the game when it was released your previous experiences uh with it uh james did you ever get to play umbrella chronicles before now or, or you know we went through a palaver getting you <laughs> get able to play the game we got it but we got there in the end did you you've not experienced this before now i take it oh uh, no no in fact this is my Really, until I'm talking like in-house arcade time crisis, this is the first time I've really played real shooter. Excellent, that'll be interesting then. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Jordan, what's your previous experience with Umbrella Chronicles? Did you play this before now? Uh, yeah, I did. I actually um, I bought it at launch. Um, I, re- I remember Nintendo Official Magazine had a, a like a magazine cover, and it was uh, like a zombie hand, you know, reaching out from the ground and. It's very generic, but it was holding the Wii remote, and it was kind of yeah. Like, I remember that. Oh, so oh, Resident Resident Evil on the Wii, exciting! And not only that, it would be, I think it actually dropped within the first year. Uh, it was like in November or so, and uh, yeah, it was it was exciting because uh, you know off the bat you're you're getting uh, Capcom involved, and they're bringing a new Resident Evil game. Um, I think. Uh, the ports for uh, remake and zero may have been around this time as well, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it was exciting. It's like, oh well, this is an entirely new experience, technically, um, and uh, you know, it's a rail shooter. I love rail shooters, as I mentioned in the House of the Dead episode. Um, so I knew I was going to be all over this. N- you know, no matter what the uh, you know firewall product was going to be, it was like, yeah, let's let's check this out. Excellent. Yeah, you're right. Um, with the Wii having released in Japan, at least November 2006, you're right. This came out literally a year after the Wii's launch. So very close to that one year mark. I Yeah, I remember that to a certain degree because I, uh, the sort of friends that I had at the time, we were all very much into, well, we, we are in general very much into Nintendo, to be fair, and, and the Wii and very excited about what was coming out then because there was a lot of different ideas falling out with the motion controls thing um, and a lot of of multiplayer experiences as well of course Um, so I remember playing a ton of Umbrella Chronicles when it came out I don't know if I got it on launch day but I'm pretty sure it must have been close Um, it's very distant memories now but we collectively played the crap out of it to be honest it's because it's very pick upable for other people as well you know everyone understands the i you know the controls and of just pointing and shooting and rail shoot is very simple stuff so be able to to do that at home was pretty cool so yeah some some friends that whilst they were interested in the resident evil series don't necessarily uh pick up and play the sort of core games uh we got to sort of experience this re-experience some of those stories together which was pretty cool with the multiplayer aspect um to the point where when i booted it up to play for preparation for the podcast my original save data is still on well it's on my wii u now technically um but 25 hours of Umbrella Chronicles, and that won't just be me, that'll be friends that just, you know, played it while my Wii was sitting around, um, which is quite a, quite a good amount of time for a, for a rail shooter. Uh, Steve, do you remember your first experiences with Umbrella Chronicles? Loosely. It's, uh, this is a weird one, because I bought this game before I had a Wii. I, uh, I bought this to play <laughs> at a friend's house, but I didn't have a Wii yet, but I was so excited I needed to play it, and they, let, they generously let me borrow their Wii. Nice. Uh, which led to me buying one. So I had, I had fun, fun time with it. I, I, you know, at the time, I was on my post RE4 come down. So I was like, anything with Resident Evil on it's going to be a good time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, 
Uh, smashed it. Still got the save data uh, from a old Let's Play on the YouTube channel, which is pretty cringe. Don't watch it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, and that uh, has been my saving grace because it means I could replay it for in preparation for the podcast with powered up weapons. Mm. It generally just had a good time. Excellent. Well, let's dive right in with the gameplay then of Umbrella Chronicles. As I said, rail shooter. It's fairly sort of self-explanatory. Uh, first-person perspective on rails moving around various locations in Resident Evil, but of course there is some interesting pieces here and there they've done to tweak it. Um, Steve, why don't you start us off with this one, I suppose. I guess I guess the big question is what separates Umbrella Chronicles from sort of other on-rail shooters, I guess? Uh, well, in this case, the, the environment is highly destructible. Uh, you can have equipped weapons, you can have throwable sub-weapons, and uh, you, you have like a hidden like melee attack as well as a uh, rebuff like counter move. Not to mention most of the enemies have some kind of critical weak point, which is ridiculously hard to hit unless you know what you're doing. Mm. Uh, and I think that helps set it apart because you know in, in comparison to this, like say the previous the, the previous rail shooter we did, uh, House of Dead Zombie. Most of the zombies take maybe three or four shots to the facial area, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, and they go down. In Umbrella Chronicles, it can it can vary wildly unless you get a critical hit and then just basically pop the head off like it's some kind of champagne core. <laughs> um, and a lot of the higher level play actually focuses around weapon switching. Like in preparation for this, I did not beat the entire game, so I went and saw some other people's gameplay. And there is some actual technique to how you use these sub weapons, like your shotguns and your machine mm. guns and whatnot. Like they could use it as a like a rapid like counter move on all sorts of other groovy stuff. So yeah, mechanically, it's more deep than it first appears. Yes, certainly. Not to mention blasting the environment apart for loot and files and stuff, which is always a fun time. Mm. Um, James, you said you don't have a whole lot of experience with the genre, so how did you find sort of the wealth of Umbrella Chronicles sort of options? Was it the right amount, or would you like it a bit more basic, or, or how did you feel about it? Uh, so when I was streaming it, Steve came in, um, like I was about three levels in, and he said, James, you can upgrade your guns. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, that is hard to... I forgot that was even a factor on my replay uh, until I'd basically beaten all of Zero, and then I found that option. and was like, oh, yeah, that's the thing. I think it's, I was kind of like, I was like, God, this game is so hard. Uh, you know, and that he's, yeah, you can upgrade your guns uh, in customize. I'm like, oh, because I literally thought like customize was... Like an options thing. I, I thought, yeah, I thought it was like, I was change the way i look even though you, i was like, <laughs> i don't know why but you can't see yourself so i was like i don't yeah i um, laugh at that but dark side chronicles has different uh costumes and that's a rail shooter so <laughs> i mean <laughs> you, could, you could have been accurate yeah yeah so i i didn't yeah so but but when i upgraded i mean i wasn't very good at the game i'm gonna be honest which i played it on easy and it was still pretty difficult um the gameplay of it was pretty hard to get my hand around and i'm uh, everybody grown. I'm old now, so my wrists are not as good as they used to be on the Wii, and like I could only really play after about two hours before having constant breaks, um, because I'm old. Like I'm, I imagine my 20 year old wrists would uh, be okay, but constantly having to reload and wiggle around, right. around my my knife was um, really wrecking me. Um, but it was cool to get used to because when I first started it. When I first started the game, uh, I was so bad. But as I was going through it, I was noticing techniques and stuff to get better at it. And it was, mm -hmm. it, it was, I could see myself improving um, until I got to a certain fight in the game that we'll talk about later, probably. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I, I liked the gameplay. And it wasn't like, um, so I think I'm going to say, because this is a stigma with me. So if I've thought this is a stigma, like I, you know, there's other people who've done it too. When you say rail shooter, there are a lot of people who are just, oh, it's just, it's it's on rails and it's, you know, it doesn't sound good, right? It's, it's not a good thing to explain this kind of game, right? But when I was playing it, I was immersed. Mm -hmm. They did a really good way, a good uh, job of immersing you within the gameplay, shooting and turning around and everything made sense. Um, other than a couple of like fast movements where you're trying to kill something, but like, yeah, I it, it was nice to see me uh, improve, um, even with my injuries, <laughs> several <laughs> of them, and and just trying to get this game to work. I was very, very uh, um, keen on getting this game to work, mm -hmm. so and we did in the end, and uh, I I enjoyed it. 
I enjoyed the gameplay side of it. Fantastic. I'm, I'm glad to hear. It. Yeah, I you know I agree with pretty much all of that. Um, the I'm in the same boat where it was like, man, I probably played this with no difficulty before, but it was better this time to just do it in short bursts, which is fine because the game kind of allows for that because all of its chapters are broken up that way, mm. um, and you can sort of. Can I ask what kind of Wii Remote you guys were using? Um, Mine was just a, a, standard classic, old school, original, no Wii Remote Plus or anything like that. See, I had Motion Plus on it. I think that might be why I had such a uh, a rather relaxed and chill affair, except mm. for certain sections. Well, I, I used yours, Steve. So it's... Oh, <laughs> you but... used my... Uh, uh, j- no, context for the listener, James's Wii Remote was being a bit poo. So Steve, you know, in the middle of the night, Drove around, <laughs> flung a Wii remote at his door, threw a pack of batteries, went, go on, have fun, and saved the day, maybe, <laughs> theoretically. Yeah, we tried. There was definitely an attempt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think something that's great about this game, because um, what you're saying about sort of on rails and maybe that producing some eye rolls. Um, Obviously, the way that House of Zed works, and I said we were going to mention that podcast, and we certainly have already gotten our money's worth. Um, very frenetic, very fast, it's totally, you know, that's what you would expect for House of Zed. Umbrella Chronicles does just minor things that just make it feel more akin to Resident Evil for me, which is just moving slower. You know, moments of almost exploration as the character sort of looks around the room and you get to take the surroundings in a bit. Sort of a, a mix between the action and the exploration, which is obviously a big part of Resident Evil's sort of core games. Uh, it was nice to see that in this, I, I felt. I like the sort of mix up it. It definitely provided a kind of tone, just a simple thing of your character sort of worriedly looking around the guardhouse and stuff like that. That's a good point, actually. Um, yeah, because I, I, I think I said this during my stream. Even though it's my very first on rails Resident Evil and stuff, and I mean, essentially my first on rails for a very long time, mm. um, it did feel Resident Evil, like it did. Yeah, like it, it felt Resident Evil, and like there are other games that are built like Resident Evil. Like that don't feel Resident Evil, mm-hmm. right? But this game it wasn't like RE One, it wasn't like RE Two or Three, right? But it still felt in the universe, and that's I think that's a testament, especially with the the genre that it was. Absolutely, yeah, they did a, a really good job with that. Uh, Jordan, for you, how does this sort of compare to others of the genre? I, I mean, I consider sort of like as far as sort of arcade. Uh, rail shooters i I consider time crisis 2 to be sort of a gold standard you know it's got that breakneck pace um and you're going from scene to scene and you know you're dispatching of enemies fairly quickly um you know so it's a great sort of you know adrenaline rush Mm -hmm. maybe about five to ten minutes playing that you know at an arcade or something like that and so i had a little bit of a problem kind of uh wrestling with this new generation of rail shooters when they first kind of came along. Um, I was excited, you know, when the, you know, all of these games were first being announced because uh, more than ever, uh, the actual accessibility of rail shooters at home, you know, felt within my grasp. Um, Mm. You know, before you had to get, uh, you had to get a gun con typically, and you only had maybe about three games that used it. And of course you had to have a certain TV, uh, that would re- require it but right. because of the 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 move to you know uh, lcd uh tvs it, it meant that they had to change the technology and you saw this you know throughout the the systems and consoles uh the technology of the actual uh guns and peripherals or controllers changed with the wii it was the easiest because obviously you know everything came in the box in the console that you bought so you only had to buy the game, which was certainly, a, you know, a big change. But you can see, um, like, some some uh, compromises that have to be made with the design. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if they, if they had to be made, but it seems that the developers made them anyway, uh, more to kind of accommodate for perhaps something more casual in play or something mm-hmm. that isn't necessarily going to be people standing there, you know... But legs wide out and holding the holding the controller up like it's a gun or something like that, like you would at an arcade uh, cabinet. And um, th- yeah, there's there's certain aspects where I'm I'm not necessarily a fan. Uh, having the the reticle on the screen, uh, actually having your crosshair on the screen, 
is is a little bit distracting. I know you need it because you you're, you're largely kind of aiming, but it almost kind of takes away from the more, uh, as I say, breakneck pace that you would get with something like Time Crisis, where you're just aiming where you see the enemies, and you know, obviously, on, in in most instances, you're you're going to hit your target. Because obviously you could be playing the Wii sitting down or, mm. you know, you could have the sensor above your TV or below your TV. And, you know, obviously there's already a, a slight angle difference with the way that you hold the Wii remote. They have to add those things in. I do think it takes a little bit away from the core experience of what a rail shooter is. But that's me being a purist. Um, I think that as far as an actual sort of like, you know, if we're going to call this sort of like a modern era of the rail shooters... You know, I say that with the game being from 2007, but if we were to say this is the modern era of rail shooters, uh, you know, where it's a home experience, it's a console experience, um, I think it does a lot to sort of differentiate itself and not simply just take, you know, a raw experience, which would be otherwise in the arcades, and then just, you know, kind of maybe put in some kind of concessions to help it feel more like a, a console experience. Uh, no, it, it does actually kind of go a certain distance to try and make this a Resident Evil experience. And I do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, as you say, the slower pace is great. Um, I think that the actual sort of scenario planning for each of the, the chapters is really cool. Um, I, think it, I think it works to the advantage of, you know, a typical Resident Evil narrative that you'll have sort of You'll have your set piece sequences, but then you have a little bit of downtime, and then yeah. you work your way back around to those set piece sequences. So, I, in that respect, I, it, you know, it's it's fairly strong and it's faithful. So, I, I definitely give it props for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're you, you're so right in terms of sort of like adapting for the home sort of console market, and as you said, just sort of picking up the Wii remote. Um, and it all just being there for you, unless you wanted one of those tacky bits of plastic that you could have put it in, you know, the many, many uh, sort of gun-shaped bits of plastic to put your Wii remote in. Um, but you're right, because they could have just gone, oh, there you go, boom, now you play it with the remote, with the Wiimote, it's just like arcade. Um, but they actually make use of that, you know, oh, you know, because it's not necessarily gun-shaped, we can do more with it. So the motion control, so swinging back and forth, like a knife and, uh, you know, using it as a QTE. Uh, obviously, that comes down to how you feel about motion controls in general. But, uh, you know, the swinging of a knife makes sense to me. I kind of like that. Um, the ability to swap out the weapons, like Steve said, is, is really cool. Um, those are some of the highlights for me. I do like the weapon customization, even though I, I did initially missed it. And then I did this, the thing, of course, that you shouldn't do and start spending points on early game weaponry when I probably should have just been saving it up because they kind of become irrelevant later when the better SMGs and better shotguns come. But there you go, that's just how it goes. Um, the one thing I will say about the gameplay that I'm kind of on is... Well, on the plus side, there's like collectible lore and stuff like that. And, you know, Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but these are sort of hidden... In the environment, you have to do it, destroy parts of the environment to do it. And to be honest, destroying the environment gets a little bit samey and tiring after a while, shooting out every light and shoot, trying to find what else you can take out with a gun and, and all that stuff. Plus, counterpoint, more, counterpoint well, to that statement. Sorry. Okay, go on. Right. The, the, the stairwell and the mansion is filled with paintings. Like, absolutely to <laughs> Throw the Throw a chocker. grenade. Yep. Throw a grenade, it is so satisfying watching them tumble. I agree with that, definitely. Points like that are really cool and, and sort of usage of the destructible environment is really cool. Uh, but one thing I don't like, maybe this is just me, so I'm pick, this is really like picking the tiniest little thing, but shooting out every light and you're sort of plunging yourself into darkness and not being able to see the locations and the surroundings, which is a highlight of this game, being able to, and we'll talk about it more, being able to come through these places that you know from previous experiences, in sort of most players' case anyway, uh, is a shame. It kind of puts a damper on it because you are encouraged to destroy as many things as possible and pick up as many files as possible every time you play to get a better rank, to 
get better points to upgrade your guns or in some cases unlock additional secret scenarios uh, so going around a lot of the game in dark and not being able to see locations uh, as they're meant to be lit is kind of a shame but that yeah, as i say I, I feel like i'm really picking at something small there um steve are there any particular other than blowing paintings up with grenades is there any particular sort of uh, additions to the format that really stand out for you sort of the you know the additional weaponry customization stuff like that honestly uh, it, this is going to sound like a real real strange thing but the segments in this game which utilize you know like size quite right rightly pointed out where you can break most of the environment apart and you can destroy lights and all these other things which i think is kind of nifty you know Walking into an umbrella facility and absolutely wrecking the place is just hilarious. <laughs> but yeah. it's when the game decides to give you a torch and, it, you know, it doesn't visually look like the most astounding and, and, you know, any kind of high fidelity thing. It looks like, frankly, like Alien Resurrection on the PS1, but it's such a nice thing to have that attached to your reticule, exploring your environments. And a controversial mm. section of the game, I might add, you know, in the, the, the end of Raccoon City stuff... Like, there's actually the whole train sequence with the light going around that kind of area and exploring the environment, finding monsters. I thought it was really good. Sometimes Steve is just impressed by a little torch. <laughs> um, but no, uh, the way they've implemented a lot of the monsters, although some of them get a bit samey, and the fact they've managed to find ways to put these Resident Evil icons into a rail shooter is nice as well, I think. And they all have their own critical hit states. Mm. And I would argue somehow they've made the web spinner's eyes kind of cute. <laughs> Maybe it was the range at which I was sat to the screen a good meter away, but they kind of looked almost adorable as I was shooting them away. Making a B.O.W. adorable is no small feat, especially when it's a giant sodden spider. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I've definitely got things to say on enemies and, and stuff like that. Um, James, what, what did you like most about sort of the parts of the gameplay, like, you know, as we say, the knife and things like that? Uh, <laughs> so... Without saying too much, my, mm, my 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 settings were a bit off um, when it came to that. I don't think I was playing a, as intended, the game as intended. Right. But I tried to do it as best as I could as intended. Um, I really like the knife work. Uh, I like the, the fact that you could just spam the knife <laughs> yep. if uh, any of anything got close to you. Like the game, I like. I like it because the game tries to like say to you, yeah, shoot these crows down or shoot the bats down, you know, but no, why should I do that when I can just spam the knife, you know, so when they fly into you, they will just instantly die. And also you don't have to spend ages trying to shoot these freaking like yep. creatures. That, um, that knife is like a, strapping a lawnmower to your chest. Isn't it? <laughs> it yeah. is. It's got a 1000 RPM knife. It's, it's great. Um, yeah, um, that, that, like, like, I'm trying to think of, like, I'm trying to think of downsides, like, because you all have, like, kind of made small little, you know, issues you've had. And, like, <sighs> the only issues I had were getting the game starting. And then <laughs> it was settings that was out of the game's control. Mm -hmm. Right? So I can't really be critical of the game because I did have fun. Good. And most of the, most of the dis disadvantage was just because of my age. And uh, which I guess could be a nitpick, but that's because I'm old, you know, so I can't I can't really like peg the game for that. Mm. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I, I feel like my experience in this like, kind of genre is lacking as well. So I can't um, like compare it to I had a ton of fun with Time Crisis back in the day and uh, but I can barely remember it. <laughs> um, so it was nice to slow down. Um, but my only problem with it was was me just falling apart. Um, <laughs> the game was the game was super fun to play, and like, yeah, every, everything everything worked as good. well. Like, That's I good. didn't I didn't get like I didn't like get like random crashes, or I didn't feel like I was cheated out of stuff until a certain boss fight. Mm -hmm. We'll get there. We'll get there. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. I like I'm, I see what you're saying in terms of not having necessarily. This sort of anything to compare this to as such as perhaps being um something that sort of pulls away from the scope of your review but on the other hand not having anything to compare it to is also perhaps a good thing <laughs> you know yeah. you, you don't have any sort of like well it's not as good as this or whatever um so like, the important I, thing is you just had fun to be honest and you know, I, with, with a game yeah. like that that's this which is you know it's just 
even though it's slowed down and it's not nearly as frenetic as some games in this, in this genre, of course the clear point of it is just to have fun regardless. Yeah, and it was like, yeah, and I did. <laughs> you know, I Good. did have fun uh, with the game. Um, I think, you know, just based on my uh, reaction to trying to get it working and then, like, actually playing the game and stuff, I think a lot of folks might have misunderstood my mm-hmm. frustration with it because, like, I really did enjoy the game. I wouldn't have played it for, like, eight hours if if I didn't enjoy it. You know, I really wanted to get it working, and then when I did, I was like, oh, this is a blast. What, you you can shoot the things around and they give you points? What? <laughs> you, know, and it, you know, and then you can upgrade weapons, and oh, crap, you can choose different weapons you know I was, and there's law you know and i was like yeah it was great and it was it was great to of course pick up rebecca as well mm-hmm. um you know i didn't play billy but only rebecca of course um <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i i do you know what actually um that first scorpion fight so i i particularly like it when a game teaches you mechanics like but practically Right, of right. course. And like instead of going do this and then this do, you know, it's mm. you know, with a text box, that scorpion, it's a it's a learning process about how the rest of the game is gonna go. For sure. Right. If you don't hit that scorpion like in its head or its tail, like then you're doing no damage to it. If you don't hit its tail when it's about to go for its lunge, it's going to hit you. Mm-hmm. Like and that is just like a primer for the rest of the game. And I really like that. Uh, again, speaking from an experience, that's probably a, a staple in rail rail shooters, but I, I like that a lot as well. To some degree, I think obviously this game wants, with some arcade games, obviously they just want to take your money a little bit, um, so they're hard just for the sake of being hard. Whereas, yeah, I think this is m- more like we want you to play you more, but you'll need to you need to understand what you're doing uh, and sort mm. of understand that timing and and as Steve has pointed out, a critical hit spaces are important and incredibly satisfying as well when you can get oh, them yeah. right um yeah I'm, I'm 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 glad to hear it we'll get into sort of breakdowns of scenarios a bit uh shortly um yeah the law is just something else i yeah i wanted to mention even though a lot of it obviously is just files from games just transposed onto this game um there is some sort of new reports and documents and sort of digests uh which which is nice and there's a there's a game actually We'll talk about the side stories, just filling the gaps and stuff. But also, you know, the the new files and reports added just just some extra little details, are like on on certain BOWs and stuff. That is really cool. Completely un, sort of quote unquote unnecessary, but just adds an extra little bit of flavor. Stuff that you don't think about, like you know, uh, the Chimera one says its its body is full of maggots because it's a fly, and it's like that makes it extra disgusting. Thanks. And <laughs> there's a file on the uh, giant roaches. Um, which I completely forgot about, where it talks about a a war in Raccoon City sewer between the infected rats and the infected roaches, and the roaches win the war and drive the, that's the rats amazing. back. amazing. <laughs> Basically is what it's saying. It's like, that's that's really cool. I completely forgot that was a thing. Um, so, yeah, I really appreciate just flicking through the, the whole law section of the options. Um, Jordan, in terms of... We talked, obviously, about everything specific, but, you know, what stood out to you with uh, what makes this game different? What, what, what did you enjoy the most or perhaps could have been worked on a bit better? Primarily the uh, scenario planning. I thought that was a that was a strength of the design. Um, the, the fact that the, the game understands that it is a rail shooter, but it's a rail shooter at home. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you try to kind of treat uh, just a typical rail shooter the same way you treat it at the arcade... It would expect you to kind of stand and play it for, you know, maybe 45 minutes to an hour if you were going to play the full thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas this, it, um, it it decides to just sort of break up the not only the, you know, the actual act, uh, but, but every segment into smaller chunks. Mm-hmm. And you typically have, you know, all the types of sequences that you were, you know, you would have throughout a rail shooter mission uh, and usually topped off with a kind of a boss at the end and like maybe a little bit extra and you know cut scenes on either side i I think that works great because this is uh at its best when you're kind of playing it in a burst Mm. Uh, i mean you know me and my friend you know we played this so much when we first got it uh but we played it throughout the day it was kind of like we didn't just like play it constantly for two or three hours it was kind of like right you put the controllers down and you know come back to it after a little while have another round and kind of 
treat it as something a bit more intense, even though it's obviously it does have a slower pace because of the uh, you know Resident Evil theming, which obviously you know works you know wonderfully. Um, it, it it's even the game itself recognizes that you're not necessarily going to be playing this all in one go. Um, I mean, at least from from my memory, it kind of it basically boots you back to the menu after you finish an act anyway. Yes, it's kind it of does. Like, right, yeah. we're, we're like, right, we're done. If you want to keep playing, you can, but like, you might want to go and tweak your weapons or do whatever. But you know, this is ultimately a different experience from what you might get. You know, when you you know stick a pound at an uh, arcade machine and you know you want to play for five to ten minutes. So that's a real strength. And to be honest, I'm just in general, I'm quite kind of, uh, I'm I'm impressed by uh, the the capability of the developer to kind of put together something that really does kind of stand up with you know a, a typical kind of rail shooter experience. When at least from what I can tell, developers didn't really have that much experience in that. Mm. Uh, regard. Um, so it was co-developed by uh, Caviar. Um, uh, not Caviar, but Caviar. <laughs> and um, they, they seem to be a bit of a, an eclectic developer for the for the time that they were around. They uh, worked on a number of different uh, projects, most known for like the Dragon Card series and uh, Nia. Um, mm. they, did a, they did a Dragon Quest spin-off about a young Yangus from Dragon Quest VIII. But it only came out in Japan, so I don't get to play it. Um, <laughs> but obviously, perhaps the most relevant one is that they worked on Resident Evil Dead Aim. Um, oh, interesting. I don't know if, huh. I, if we actually have, have covered Dead Aim yet. No, the, we haven't. Uh, in the podcast. Uh, but obviously, that was quite some time uh, before this, and isn't necessarily wholly relevant to the experience um, of developing you know, both of the Chronicles games. But I just thought that was quite interesting because mm. I did wonder. I thought, have they come from a, a background where they've worked on previous light gun games? Um, you know, it's a pretty small world in terms of kind of mm. developers for those kind of games. I mean, I mean, I know over at Namco, they largely have the same people working on the different, uh, you know, strains. And uh, yeah, I was I was kind of curious about that. But considering this is effectively, you know, their first proper. Uh, rail shooter experience i think they did really well that's really cool i i had no idea and yeah to a certain extent you can see a slight through line from dead aim to this i suppose you know so yeah that's that's really interesting um okay let's look at the game sort of visually and audio and what we think of it from that terms of sort of where the quality lies there um you know the wii was uh, a console that was obviously more focused on its gameplay and the way that games were played compared to its competitors at the time, sort of the advent of, of HD uh, and stuff like that. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's a fine enough looking game. It's not the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. I think, you know, graphically you can tell that some of these are just PS2 and GameCube assets that are resed up a little bit. Um, but, you know, it it totally works the the world comes together nicely it's it's because it's on rails as well um it doesn't really have any issues with frame rate or load load times or anything like that it's it's very consistent in what it's doing um uh as steve said you know it's it's cool to see some of these bow's up close and stuff like that as i just mentioned the horrible disgusting maggot filled chimera uh, always a personal favorite um, i think it's bit of an underrated little monster to be honest so it's cool to see them crop up a lot more in this game and get to see them up close horrible little things um and stuff like that and whilst i agree with you jordan about perhaps you know the, the reticle being a bit distracting um in terms of uh, other games uh, in the light gun genre i can totally see where you're coming from and it would be nice if perhaps there's an option to turn it off or, or an expert mode without it or something um i do like that it has this sort of like red ghostly sort of afterglow thing when you move it around it gives you a good idea of you know the, the speed that you're moving at um and the other little visual cue that i like is the little inverted flash of colors you get before quick time events uh, a to let you know that there's a quick time event coming, and B it feels like a nice little nod to the um, live selection from Resident Evil Three. Uh, Jordan, how do you feel about the sort of visuals of Umbrella Chronicles? Yeah, well, I mean that was one of actually the kind of the big pulls at the time was uh, 
we were going to be seeing a lot of familiar places mm -hmm. um, from a completely different perspective, and that was exciting. Um, I mean, considering that you know, going back to uh, you know the mansion itself from both Zero and Resident Evil One, that was exciting in and of itself, especially because it was obviously it was borrowing certain assets, um, you know, from those games uh, from from the GameCube, which I I think helped it because. Obviously, it's not a major step away from uh, the, the the graphical sophistication. Yeah, it wasn't exactly a big jump, was it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, in a way, it's actually quite impressive that they were able to kind of pull it off. Because, as we know, they weren't able to pull it off uh, back when they made you know remake. That's all pre-rendered. Now, I mean, they probably could have had a go, uh, but they they went with the fidelity of the pre-rendered, and obviously, it, it still stands out as a as an amazing visual. I think that Umbrella Chronicles does a decent job of uh, trying to represent that that same feel because it, it it definitely kind of taps into uh, at least for you know Zero and Resident Evil One uh, th those scenarios uh, it, it definitely tries to tap into the same uh, visual styling and uh, you know design of the house mm -hmm. um, and that was really exciting uh, just for the fact that it's wow this is. Uh, an instantly recognizable place and uh, you know it doesn't look that far off uh, what we'd obviously previously experienced you know some uh, six, six five or six years before um, but uh, it's it's obviously it's a little bit weak in places it especially around the time of sort of 2007 up to maybe about 2011 there were just a lot of games that seemed to kind of uh, really wash out the the color palette and yeah. uh i you know especially in in some of the kind of later sequences especially during like sort of uh the raccoon city sequences it just felt a little bit bland it, it felt like it was doing a little bit of a disservice um to you know what is meant to be very iconic recognizable locations that all just kind of gets kind of caught in a bit of a you know a, a gray brown yellowy wash so that was a little bit of a shame but i mean it's clear enough that you know the visuals never feel too muddy that you can't really tell what's going on um you know it, it's clear enough in that in that manner um and I, as you say the fidelity is actually pretty good like there's no kind of slowdowns um be, because it's on rails it's really able to kind of refine it in, in terms mm. of performance and you know even playing it on the wii even playing it with a uh anti-tank launcher run uh it doesn't <laughs> slow down so you know there there you go that that's definitely uh you know a point in its favor but Excellent. i can imagine there's people who's definitely not not a fan of it just because maybe these are places that you've been super excited about you know seeing realized again or realized for the first time you know, from a certain perspective, and maybe mm. it doesn't always hit the right note. Yeah, that's that's fair. I hadn't thought about sort of the the wash, but you're right; it's very of its time with that. Um, James, what do you think about the game from a visual sort of perspective? Uh, yeah, I, um, so I I have an issue to counter Jordan for a second. Like I, and I imagine this is why Jordan and a lot of other people like grab this game, um, is because this is your first look into what a 3D um, RE2 and RE3 were going to be like. Mm -hmm. And like, I imagine that was a huge draw to this game. It's like, oh, wow, I want to see this game in 3D now. Because it was, I think this was the first game that gave you an actual idea, right? Of that? In terms of a fully 3D sort of RPG. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Outbreak uh, is where a lot of this stuff comes from but outbreak oh. is is sort of it's mostly fixed camera it's a 3d world but it's still got that classic resident evil f sort of camera gotcha. style uh, so you're right actually you're sort of feeling like you're in the shoes of a character walking around the area totally that was that was definitely a draw for a bit walking around the spencer mansion and the rpd yeah because that was it was really cool I was because when I was playing, I was trying to get into the mind of somebody back in like 2000 and when's this come out? Six, seven, five, seven. Um, yeah, and I was like, I was trying to get into my mindset, the mindset of that, and being like very excited because I was like, oh wow, we get to see like first person, we get to see the RPD and 
I get to see like the <laughs> I I there's this bit during my stream where we get we're just about to go in no we just came out of the uh we're just about to go to the guardhouse and between the guardhouse there is that snake pit area mm -hmm. and i was like oh there's gonna be snakes here i remember snakes you know <laughs> <laughs> and there's gonna be dogs and literally after i say that there's the snakes they yeah pop totally out, you know and i was like and it looked really good like i could see, like it it popped out at me and i mean i was playing the game upscaled like mm -hmm. if you can play this game at 1080p because Man, it looks really good. <laughs> um, or, or higher, if you can. But yeah, I I really liked how the game looked and how it like because it, I I was teleported back to the remake. I was teleported back of to course. those other games, and um, it was nice to experience them in a different angle. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the game played flawlessly, I never have any, had any hookups. Um, you know, and it was smooth. Um, yeah, I I mean, I and even the character models were great. Like when you're in the cutscenes, their cutscenes were really good in this game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I really like, I, like might talk about them a little bit more later on when we talk about the lore a bit, but like the cutscenes, the, the way they directed the cutscenes, one of my favorite sections visually is when it's right at the end, when Wesker is walking away from the Red Queen after he's just deleted her. Mm -hmm. And that zoom in, like, is so cool. Like, the visual, like, and it's just for that, that was Jill and Chris. That cutscene was, it's my favorite in the game. Right, and I I, I love cutscenes. Um, <laughs> but I think we all do. Um, but yeah, like, I don't think, I don't have much more else to add because I, I really like how it looked. And I, I was trying to look at it with, a, a modicum of rose tinted glasses sure because i was i was trying to put myself in that year again um and what i would have expected from other games that came out at the time like resident evil 4 for instance mm -hmm. um that came out the year before i think um yeah so i was i'm really happy with the visuals like those monkey things terrifying <laughs> like when they came yeah. out what are they called again eliminators eliminators yeah, they're fun yeah, aren't they <laughs> they were terrifying the spiders weren't terrifying Cute, um, apparently. Hey, I mean, they, they look know, adorable. They have big, big I, chocolate button eyes. I want. I want to defend Steve on this. Uh, I love spiders anyway. Um, these True. are te technically tarantulas, but like the spiders are super cute. Tarantulas super cute to me. These guys did look super duper cute though, and I would definitely have a plushie of one if I was given the opportunity. Um, they were not threatening. <laughs> <laughs> in any way, uh, shape, or form, the bats and the crows are more threatening than the spiders were. Mm. Um, yeah, but I mean, visually they look, look great. I just wish they had a bit more, more imposing, like tarantula esque movements. Because right. I mean, a tarantula they do move slowly, but you like get near one, it's gonna pounce on you. Mm. I was expecting that when I first saw, saw one, mm. right? But we don't see that, um, and it, I guess we don't see that in the other games either. But right. Like the most terrifying thing about those, like how looking at those and hearing those spiders in the past, those tarantulas, sorry, in the past, is that you would hear the doom, 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 right. thumping bass totally. footsteps as they come at you and then like, swipe at you. And they have a lot of HP. And yeah, so it's, you know, that's my only criticism of how. That's, that's fair. Yeah. Did anybody same, have. A... Go on. It, it's same as, same as Steve. I found the spiders very cute. Uh, did anybody have the the glitch with the spiders? You know, after after you kill them, obviously they fall on their backs and their legs close in. Um, but I don't know if it's something to do with the physics engine. But every spider that you you know I'd kill, they roll on the back and then their legs kind of like bounce in and out. Yes, they twerk. They, they they look like they look like they're kind of like having a belly laugh. <laughs> What's so funny, spider? You're dead. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I commented on that. Like, I we killed like five of them, and they all started twerking in sync. It was great. Yeah, yeah, I was all having it, all having a dance. I was playing with my partner around, and she was like, "What, what, what, what are those spiders doing?" And I was like, "That's what they do when they're dead. Don't, have you never seen a dead tarantula before? That's what, <laughs> <laughs> That's what they do. What are you talking about?" Yeah, I don't know I, what's up with that, but it's definitely a consistent thing. Um, in terms of the zombies, um, their visual look, um. <laughs> There was a lot. I could see there was a lot of borrowed textures. Yeah. yeah. Um. From uh, even other models in game, like 
I'm pretty sure one of those zombies was just a Wesker, but with <laughs> like different a different skin on him. Like, uh, yeah, I know it was very similar. And there, there was like there was there was Ganados there. Um, was there? there? Yeah, they might have done. It, to be honest, they might have. Yeah, done. there's there's one guy that definitely looks like he's he's a Ganado. <laughs> he's he on he vacation. Looks, it's fine. <laughs> he, he looks like the guy that the first guy you get a, a close up of in RE4. Interesting. Um, in the when, yeah, they the, the, says let's in go the house. where they're gone. Bingo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I agree on the asset reuse because um, I mean, when you get to the Umbrella's End, uh, you know, chapter, and you know, you're going to a completely new location, but you're getting old enemies, and mm -hmm. you know, it, it can pass easier when you know it's say hunters, but when it's the zombies, and you've got like mansion crimson heads <laughs> showing up it looks a bit weird yeah it reminded yeah. me a bit of like uh ea's dante's inferno from from quite a few years ago obviously in that game you're going through the different circles of hell and uh i remember getting to a point in that game where you know every circle of hell was meant to have like unique enemies that were obviously based on that circle uh but they very clearly were pushed for time when they were developing that game because uh, after about maybe the fifth circle, they just they just chuck in enemies from all of them. <laughs> like, eh, whatever, <laughs> you know. You you can have you can have lust enemies and gluttony enemies it, it, within this other circle of hell. That's fine. And like it really kind of threw me off because it's like, oh, I guess I'm I'm just playing the part of the game where they didn't have enough assets for, and that definitely does feel a little bit like that in this game when you get to some of the later sequences mm -hmm. i think I, for the most part like the ones based on on actual games uh you know largely keep to you know yes. their respective assets yeah but outside of that you know they're, they're scrambling mm -hmm. it's it's a bit it's a bit immersive breaking as well because you know that ganados that's less plague ass infected like and like i I was, ex I don't know why, but I was expecting when I shot it in the head, there was going to be a <laughs> thing came out and then, you know, I'm going to have to deal with that. That would be um, an immersive break in for sure. <laughs> that would be, that's the thing, right? So it's like a double, double immersive break for me. Like, cause, and then I was, you know, Angela's for instance, I see yeah. a lot of them. <laughs> for those that don't know Angela's, if you don't, haven't watched mine and FB, uh, FB Steve's, uh, Five Button Steve's uh, YouTube video. Um, YouTube series. I call the naked zombies in the lab Angela's. Don't ask me why. Um, no time to explain. Just go watch the video. Um, but yeah, you see them a lot. They just they just pop up, and they're not any more tankier than any of the other zombies either. Mm. Um, yeah, at all. But yeah, I think I think that's probably my biggest criticism is just the reuse of yeah. a lot of zombie skins. They could have. They. I would have been happier. If they just like, if they had like six or seven so zombie skins, like, and they just put them on a zombie, like a generic zombie body, and just be like, "Here's your zombies," instead, you know, they just literally just ripped a model from different games <laughs> and just plunked it in. So it was a bit, it was a bit weird to do that. Um, the bosses, the visuals of the bosses in the game, uh, great, love them, Excellent. love the bosses in this game. Um, and I get, I'll talk about them more later on mm -hmm. um, as well. Okay. Uh, Steve, what do you think of the visuals of Umbrella Chronicles? Did you spot this mysterious Ganado zombie? Yeah, it's the mirror zombie from the remake that's like early on. It just wears a waistcoat. I think I know what I think that's what the guys mean anyway. Um, right, okay. <laughs> set reuse is a significant issue that we can't really skirt around. My, my colleagues have already gone over it, but this game is like, I want to say generously, like what? 60 to 70 percent reused assets like yeah, I, I would yeah. be surprised if somewhere during the pipeline there might have been a 3d version of re zero and remake to where they called them from mm -hmm. not that going through those environments aren't fantastic like i think they're a, they are a uh, a high watermark of it looking visually comparable to re4 in terms of the level of texture detail yeah you know sure. and they've got They've got dynamic lighting as we've pointed out because you can literally shoot out almost every light that's in a fixture in the entire game so that's pretty cool too. I, I, the monsters and stuff look on par with like you know the GameCube era zombies. And you know honestly, as as the remaster of the remake has made clear, that is still pretty pretty damn good. Pretty damn good to shoot the heads off those things, you know. Um, and then you get to uh, Raccoon's Destruction, and then the Outbreak zombies with the obviously lower level detail still <laughs> managed to make an appearance. And mm. 
there are apparently two zombie, two types of zombie ladies in Raccoon City. The lady with the glasses and the black dress and the lady in the blue top. And never shall there be any other. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's strange. They have so many diverse model sets for that bit. But not when it comes to the ladies. You've got dudes in hats and uh, safety gear, about 400 different versions of police officer. And then, you know, that, that one uh, dude in a red shirt, that one zombie that storms Jay's bar. And just two ladies models. It's, um, yeah, all the monsters, obviously, except for the new creatures for this game, are pulled from previous games, with the exclusion, I think, of the Ivy. Yeah, I would imagine uh, so. And the bosses. Uh, not, not to detract from it. You know, you know, it looks great. Mm-hmm. It really does look great. Uh, but, that, you know, for someone like me who's played the Outbreak games, who's played the remakes and all these other ones to death, Asset reuse is uh, it's across the board. It's it's worse than say um, the the latest takes of like Resident Evil Three remake or or Reverse mm-hmm. and you know the dreaded top. <laughs> um, you know it, it's it's pretty on the nose. But I suppose when a game that like this is meant to be a compilation of going through these events, it makes sense. You know that the mm-hmm. zombies that you see would be there. With, you know with the exception to maybe literally zombies from the mansion in 1998 now showing up in the middle of Russia somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know I guess they couldn't figure out how to rig up some more crimson haired models at the time. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm being very generous. I think there. <laughs> but no, on the whole, it, it looks good and it maintains a solid aesthetic throughout, despite the variety. That's fair. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. And the environments alone, like they are stunning. I think even even the uh, the washed out outbreak maps that are reused. I think you know the way that you go through them. I kind of surprised no one's done a first person mod for outbreak in some form or another mm. because it shows that it could possibly work. Indeed, uh, indeed, I'm excited to talk about that scenario for reasons. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah it's, it... I'm sure everyone's looking forward to that. <laughs> and now. Reading the file, reporter's memo from Resident Evil 3 nemesis, Jordan Vulick, who you can follow on Twitter, at MetWars. At last I have found the evidence I need to prove that the cannibal disease is indeed happening in the city. One man actually ate people to death. He was like a savage animal, tearing away at new flesh. It was completely disgusting. I have heard rumors that many people are also suffering from this disease now. However, the causes of the disease is not yet known. Is this another mystery of the present disease? I'll have to check on it. They have placed Raccoon City under martial law because of the cannibal disease. I have lost contact with the media outside of the city, but I won't give up. As a journalist, I won't keep my eyes shut and walk away. I have a duty to the people and my profession. I don't think the disease has spread nationwide yet. I believe that this city holds the key to its creation and cure. In fact, I'm sure of it. The military has set up blockades around the city to keep people from escaping and spreading the disease. Most of the citizens have either died or have come in contact with the disease. I know that it is the right decision to quarantine the city, but I can't help but pity myself. If I am infected or eaten, It doesn't matter. My fate is already sealed. All I have left is my journalism. I won't give up until I solve the mystery of this deadly disease. I have just discovered that the disease is not spread through the air, but by some other means. Um, Let's talk about audio then before we start breaking down the different chapters of this game. Um, Steve, what do you think of the... The music, the voice acting, sound effects, all that stuff. That starts with the music. Where is the vinyl? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I, I'm not even kidding. There's, there's a lot of tracks in this that are uh, very dancey and samey, but the remixes are fantastic. And that main yeah. theme on the main menu is like, you know, if Resident Evil needs a theme and we are for some reason short, running short of them, there you go. Bang. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, the voice acting, I would argue, is serviceable it's mm. it's not great is it it's it'll do like i mean i think the jarring ones are earlier on with billy going through two different voice actors in the space of literally 30 seconds mm-hmm. uh, uh rebecca's voice actress draws it out because it has that kind of anime voice actress doing a child's voice thing going on 
Uh, she um, she is an anime voice actor. Yeah, and it it sounds like a, a middle aged lady is trying to voice Ash Ketchum kind of thing for me. It kind of draws me out a bit. I don't I don't hate Rebecca as a result, but I prefer Reva De Palma's depiction. In you know, All right. Uh, I think this is Patricia Jarley's first take as Jill. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Uh, okay, okay, fantastic. Uh, is it Kevin Dorman as Chris? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Yeah, uh, I believe he reprises the role in Vendetta. I could be wrong. Um, you are correct. He he was all right. Uh, I think Chris was a little bit like, I am generic action man for my taste. Uh, <laughs> and then Wesker. I hate this voice. I, I absolutely, I, you know, I can put it with RE5, DC Douglas. This this version of Wesker, it's it's awful. It just sounds like a posh git. Like, Charmed. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's, it's insufferable. It's, it's someone putting on a cartoonish villain accent. You can hear the moustache being twirled every line he says. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. So yes. princi- principally, voice acting is great. Actually, I think my standouts may actually be Richard. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's uh, fair. As an actual, just a, a human being trying to look at, and there's some like genuine emotion to his his performance. I think Yuri Lowenthal does a great job. Mm. Uh, and sadly, he gets bit. But you know. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah so, uh, as, for, as far as guns and sounds and stuff, it feels cheap to turn around and say, "Yeah, they're pretty good," but that's because they're from all the bloody games. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> they, uh, they do, and this, I would argue it, 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 it bleeds over into like Doom Eternal's. Uh, you know, when you headshot a zombie, and that there's a very much a very similar pop cork sound when you get a critical hit. So it's nice to have that audio audible feedback for when you've done a good job and done popped a zombie skull cap in it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and the reload sounds, there is something satisfying about the shotgun. I feel like I'm just meandering. Basically, sound effects are solid because they, they, they have been they're tried and true, aren't they? Yeah, there is um, that. I suppose the advantage this has, and I always really love the fact that the Wiimote has its own little speaker. So that's kind oh, of yes. a nice little feature getting sort of like all your uh, gun sounds and your reload sounds, your firing sounds through the, the Wiimote, which is nice. Makes makes those reload sound effects even more satisfying when they're coming from your hand. Uh, but you're Reloading right. the massive shotgun and yes. hearing your Wii remote just go click, 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 click. is satisfying. Yeah, completely agree. They're the worst sound effects. I just, I just want to throw it out there easily by a country mile. By you know, like the 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 one end of the earth to the other is is Nemesis's voice acting. Oh, terrible! I'll leave, yeah. you, I'll leave you with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, terrible. Absolutely, absolutely awful. Who thinks he's a robot man? I don't know what, where. Why? What even that's about? But there you go. That uh, ball was dropped into an abyss. Like uh, <laughs> that ball was dropped so hard. Yeah, we'll get to Nemesis for sure. My least favorite sound effect, actually, maybe controversial take, is the uh, the first aid spray healing sound, which is just too Silent Hill for me. Uh, it does. <laughs> I don't know. It just doesn't feel very Resident Evil uh, in, in my book. So not massively keen on that. Um, yeah, voice acting, I generally agree. I think Chris and Jill are some of the the better characters from the game out of the lot. But mostly they're just they're fine. I did like Kevin Dorman's Chris because he, he sounds very close to Joe White's Chris. Um, so when you're playing the remake scenario, it's kind of nice because it's, it's pretty close. But yeah, th- those guys did pretty good. Mostly it's just as basic and cheesy. And as you say, Wesker is very unrefined uh, DC Douglas at this point. For music... It's yeah, it's decent, you know. Most of the time, I couldn't really hear it. I'd have to. I need to go back and listen to the soundtrack because there were parts I remember enjoying while I was playing with it. But uh, you know, other than the menu theme, nothing really stuck with me. What the Wesker's scheming theme, as you once called it, of course. Again, that falls into sort of asset reuse because it's uh, it's a remix of a song from the Resident Evil Two soundtrack. It's uh, all right. It gets his own James Bond stuff. Oh, it gets. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but but it is re- a really well done piece of music, so I don't mind at all. Um, Jordan, how do you feel about the game from an audio sort of point of view? I think the the music serves its purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, it was actually one of the things, kind of going back. It was one of the, the things I was first thinking about. What's what's the music actually uh, like in this game? And uh, obviously, it, it didn't necessarily stick with me. Uh, that greatly that I had to kind of ask that question. So uh, it's not necessarily that remarkable, but at the same time, it isn't jarring. It isn't trying to kind of maybe take you out of the moment, um, and it feels perfectly paced. Uh, You know, whoever is obviously given the task of actually composing the music for the game 
uh, understood how to kind of fit it to the scenarios, and it, yeah, it never felt out of place, at least. Um, with regards to voice acting, uh, yeah, uh, you know, typically it was kind of comes down to rather than not necessarily kind of being the fault of the voice actors, but but rather the the direction that they're they're given or lack of direction that right. they're given. Um, I think with something like this, when you know, when the scenario planning can be uh, so specific um, that uh, you should be able to afford better direction for your actors uh, so that they know how to talk, you, you know, how, how to converse with one another. You know, if you're in the middle of an action sequence, it shouldn't be, you know, this calm exchange between, you know, Jill and Carlos. It should be frantic and shouting. Mm -hmm. There's only one way you're going to be doing that sequence, so at least do it right. Um, that's just a an issue that I have sometimes with, with voice acting, especially in games, not necessarily matching uh, the, the scenario. But yeah, there's only so much I can I can kind of put on the actors in in that manner because maybe with with better direction, you know, they're actually able to put in the performance that the the scenes deserve. Obviously, you don't necessarily expect much from the voice acting anyway, but still, um, yeah, it, it's it's quite a crime what happened with. Nemesis. Now, Ain't it uh, you know, I got I got a friend that when I when I when I played uh, when I played this game for the first time uh, with my mate, you know, he was excited for Resident Evil Three. Resident Evil Three is one of his favorite games ever. Absolutely loves it. Absolutely loves Nemesis. Um, and the first time that you see him, and he says stars. Uh, my my friend was on the floor. He was laughing his ass off, which is obviously the worst reaction that you could have when it's meant to be the guy, the most sort of like terrifying of the enemies, you know, throughout much of the, you know the Resident Evil series, and the first words out of his mouth just make you laugh. And yeah, that was probably that was probably the worst part. And that wasn't even like a you know a main speaking role character, just one word, and they messed it up. <laughs> so. Yeah, the voice, the voice acting, you know, a bit shaky, but 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 whatever. I think, I think overall, like the sound was was alright. It certainly sounded like Resident Evil, um, mm. you know, for the most part. So, um, you know, nothing about it kind of felt alien, um, which I thought was was good. That you know, this largely felt like, uh, you know, something that Capcom had their hands all over. It wasn't something that they were just sort of giving to a different uh, developer and it coming out. Uh, rather detached from the experience. If you've come from a Resident Evil game and you go over to play Umbrella Chronicles, apart from acclimatizing for the actual controls, uh, it is it is very much of the experience of Resident Evil. In that respect, um, you know it's pretty strong and you know easy to acclimatize to. Mm -hmm. James, thoughts on the audio side of things? Uh, yeah, I uh, I really love the I really love the music, uh, but again, like I couldn't. I couldn't hear the music during the game, mm -hmm. like much like yourself, Sai. But every time I started this game up, which was a lot, <laughs> <laughs> um, I really loved the theme tune. There was also like That's a great. save theme tune as well, which was pretty great. Um, like that soft kind of tune that came out. Mm -hmm. I, right, right now I've had like the entire OST running in the background at low volume. And I'm just kind of bopping to them because they're actually pretty good. I just never hear them <laughs> um, while I'm, you know, while I'm I'm, I'm playing the game. Um, and there's some there's some questionable titles for some of these these songs. Oh, really? um, of course, like Ada Ada's one is called the Oriental Woman, uh, oh. for instance. Mm. Yikes! Um, I just, like, but the song is a bop. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, just like that title is crap. Um, but yeah, in terms of like the, the way the, like how the guns work, they're good. Resident Evil doesn't really fail in that unless you're really bad, like a certain game that we played recently. Um, <laughs> and like, yeah, they're good. Uh, and I can't really add anything in terms of the voice acting because I completely agree with Jordan. If you're not told in that sheet, what is happening, you know, yeah. when you're, right. you know, with voice direction, then you know, you're going to do your best, <laughs> you know? And yeah, I don't, I don't really blame the voice actors at all. Like, cause they sound serviceable just in different situations. Like completely. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I think like my favorite. I think I'm biased here, but same as Steve is Yuri with with Richard. I love Yuri Lowenthal. Mm-hmm. He's one of my heroes. Um, him and Tara Strong, great, amazing people. Um, and I really like Sergi. <laughs> oh, okay, interesting. I like. <laughs> I thing is, I have a soft spot for Russian accents. Like the the guy at Sites, Patrick Sites, is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, he uh, clearly is not Russian, right? Um, but like, I do. I love a Russian accent, right? So whenever I hear one, I'm like, yeah, instantly I like you. Because so, so. yeah, he's a very likable character. So. <laughs> he is, he's yeah, a great, he's no. a great human. As a fan of the, you know, it's a seminal classic Command and Conquer Red Alert too. I was right at home with that Comrade General. You know, it's very on the nose, <laughs> musky voice. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was. I, I liked him. I like his. I even though like the this DC Douglas Wesker it was not fantastic. I did like the. Uh, kind of to and throw conversations mm. that they were having. Um, I felt like maybe Patrick and DC maybe conversed a little bit there because it did feel a bit more connected and linked with the game, unlike everything else in the game. Um, I agree with Steve that like the person who did, like uh, Stephanie Shea, who did um, Rebecca, like I wasn't getting Rebecca from mm. Shea. Like at all, and I wasn't getting the peril she was in either, other than in parts of the nightmare uh, 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 segment. Um, yeah, uh, zombies sound great, but mm-hmm. they're zombies. I can yeah. groan as well as anybody else. You know, <laughs> uh, you know. In fact, our groans are on our Twitch channel. You know, of me, you can hear my to- my groans if you follow us on. <laughs> Twitch.tv slash FAS Playpod. Um, but uh, yeah, like, they sound good. That might uh, be the weirdest plug we've ever had. Hey, Hold on for that. Yeah, you're welcome. You can take that out if you want. <laughs> and launching next month, we'll be having groans available on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> groans and moans. I think you, you guys are right, you know, in terms of the voice actor and a lack of direction, of course. It needs to be said that this is like a... I think across the board, a brand new cast as well. So they didn't have any previous experience with these mm. characters or even really understanding the scenarios that they're in necessarily. So, yeah, I think you're uh, right on the money with that one. And uh, the, oh, go ahead. The, the monsters, like, uh, the monsters, the monster sounds sound great. Like, hearing the bats coming was terrifying. Hearing the crows coming was terrifying. Mm. Like, that sound direction was great. You would hear, if you're playing surround, you would hear it coming from behind you, etc. Um great use of sound there um and it's way easier to, i imagine i mean i don't want to like step into the development stage but i imagine it's it's a lot easier to do that in a rail shooter as well um i just right. appreciate that yeah that um, makes sense yeah yeah um but yeah uh i love the ost i'm listening to it right now it's great could oh, i hear you, it during the game you need to go no. listen it out. Say, say again <laughs> Yeah. You all need to go and listen to it outside of the context of just shooting things. It's actually pretty fantastic. Yeah, it's great. And then, like even in the stage select is great. The save kind of soft tunes are great. Mm-hmm. Um I if I was gonna give it if I was gonna give it a rating side, uh I would give it seventy eight moists out of a hundred. <laughs> that's that's a lot of moist. That's so it's <laughs> like da- over overly damp, yeah. <laughs> right, so let's break down scenarios um just a little bit um so this game is made up or as we've made pretty clear i think uh, for anyone that hasn't played it uh, retellings of resident evil zero the original resident evil specifically the 2002 remake uh, something that's called resident evil 3 and umbrella's end which is a brand new chapter uh, on the end as well and on top of just retelling these stories they all have at least one sort of little uh, extra unlockable side story as well. Um, so what I just want to do really sort of, not quite lightning round, but, you know, make your points uh, when, when I when I call your name. We're just going to go through each of these chapters, starting with uh, Train Derailment, which is the one based on Resident Evil Zero, and any thoughts you might have about the additional scenario. So in this case is Beginnings, which is the sort of the prelude. So this game is 
pretty Wesker heavy, which is, you know, kind of nice. We get to play as Wesker. Um, so this is Wesker uh, leaving the training facility, uh, in theory, to head off to fly back towards the mansion um, the next day for the events of Resident Evil. Um, so let's start with, well, let, James, let's start with you as the Rebecca fan. Uh, positives and negatives about what you thought of the retelling of Resident Evil Zero, uh, what it did successfully or otherwise, anything that stood out to you for the train derailment section of Umbrella Chronicles. Okay, so uh, lightning round, let's go. Uh, so Resident Evil Zero is a worse game than train derailment <laughs> okay uh, interesting <laughs> it was way more fun i i didn't play resident evil zero right but <laughs> you know about the inventory system so. i know about the inventory system <laughs> right which it completely wrecks the game like watching steve you did do play that. it james you just know the controller i did <laughs> right yeah true like but like it was so painful seeing steve play this game right but train derailment like it was so much fun playing it on the rails like with the shooting and and i learned just as much to be honest um <laughs> it was yeah the boss was great um it was nice to get some uh just it, it was nice to, as james to get some hands-on experience here with this game mm -hmm. um this story um it was way more fun than re0 like mm -hmm. this section I, that's that's it that's fair do you know Mike i drop <laughs> it sounds like a controversial statement, but you've backed it up with some logic there because RE Zero's biggest complaint is that it's it's slow and clunky, and of course, this is the complete opposite end of that. You know, to to an extreme, of course, but this and this is very uh, true of all of these. Of course, is just hitting the high points. You know, there obviously there's no puzzle solving involved with this game. You're just bashing through certain doors, uh, shooting enemies, and moving on. So you, yeah, you get sort of just sort of like an insight into what Resident Evil Zero is sort of setting wise and sort of series of events. Mm. Um, obviously the big change in this one um, is the the uh, James Marcus. He's he's no longer a long haired uh, lover from Liverpool, you know, singing young man. <laughs> <laughs> That's a reference. Um, he You just see him as the old man at the end, which some people prefer. Um, I'm I'm in that camp actually. I I just kind of like him being the croaky old dude at the end. Steve, how do you feel about that specifically and uh, train derailment and beginnings in general? Okay, so I think this is like a a tidy, solid like tidy is a good word. It, yeah, it's it, it's it's a nice um, four out of five in terms of you know barring it and the whole game in terms of how I'm feeling and my level of enjoyment. Uh, I I'm torn because old man Marcus, I kind of there's something so ridiculously over the top and ostentatious about Sephiroth Marcus <laughs> that I, I can't separate. At least they both say the best vocal delivery of any motivation for a villain in the Resident Evil series. <laughs> Although there's one has a bit more emphasis and one's more like and the world will burn in inferno of hate. You know, it needs that mad maniacal laughter and the mm -hmm. puking up of leeches for some reason and his eyes going wide yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. that's there's fair something, there's something a bit more crazy about it in the og but overall i do think it's a great little thing because it's obviously it's the tutorial section so it's going to be a bit, little bit more slower pace you know slower paced but it's um i don't know how to describe it there's just a, a lot more rhythm to it and less cheap shots than there are later in the games mm. in, in the stages rather and uh, the training facility being cut down like by about what seventy five percent is nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. As much as I like that building and the actual arch 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 the architectural design, going around it would have been tedious. Because a lot of it's like spokes on a wheel. It's not not all that intriguing or as uh, labyrinthine as the mansion. Totally. So that's solid cutting it apart. And the lab is the lab. It's a bit generic. It's pipey. It's got steam everywhere. Oh no, there's leeches. And now that now it's over. Uh, is what I want to say. Although this is uh, a controversial topic, I feel like the Leech Men were nerfed too much. Um, they only appear really in this segment. They kind of just wiggle a bit and then they die. Mm. In the in the game they're from, they are like the the super threat, really, aren't they? They're the, they're the, the deadliest thing where you need fire or you leg it, really. In this, just blast a bit. They they fall over, they wibble, and then they die. It's kind of a bit anticlimactic. I would have yeah. liked to. I agree would have liked with that. to have used the the um the railgun shooting to actually shoot them apart maybe or something you know there's mm. there's there's means and 
what not to do that. We've had RE4, have dynamic shooting and blow them to bits. That would be cool. Yeah, they they definitely don't stand out. They're quite, once you you know put in the 10 hours or whatever it takes you to get through every single scenario, um, they're definitely all very forgettable in the grand scheme of things, especially being obviously at the beginning of the game. But yeah, they don't really pose much of a threat other than maybe at the beginning of <laughs> Beginnings 2 where there's a room full of loads of them. But uh, again, it's literally the first part, I think. Um, mm. And then you you know if you don't do it just reload do it again eventually after that on you go and you don't have to worry about them again so yeah I agree with that and I agree with what you were saying about Billy's voice changing as well when we were talking about audio um, even though I don't think it's credited particularly if you've if you got an ear for it that is clearly uh, Roger Craig Smith doing the voice of Billy in the cutscenes but then when you get to the gameplay it's Steve Van Warmer um, which is which is weird. It's, it's very distracting, but they, yeah. I, don't, I don't know why that's a thing, but it is because Ro- it's not like Roger Craig Smith plays anyone else in this game, I don't think. So no. Why is that a thing? <laughs> it's the only time he's played Billy, and it's in the cutscenes of Umbrella Chronicles and not the gameplay. Bizarre. Uh, Jordan, thoughts on the retelling of Resident Evil Zero? Uh, yeah, I, th- I thought it was a, a solid uh, you know, entry throughout the game. Uh, it's... It, it's probably as far as kind of like a rail shooter is concerned where I felt most at home because especially in the beginning, you know, I mean, you're literally, it's literally a rail shooter because you're on a train. Um, but actually kind of because it's more uh, corridor shooting uh, where it's largely things in front of you, um, I was like, oh yeah, this is, you know, proper kind of, mm. you know, rail, rail shooter deal here. It's just kind of like, right, shoot things and shoot things fast. And uh, I really like that aspect. I like the aspect of uh, it being more claustrophobic um, in places and not always using, you know, zombies as the enemies, but also the leeches, Um, you know, so you never necessarily feel like you're getting a breather even in those tight spots. If if anything, you're actually going to end up getting bottlenecked, which this game's really good at doing. It's really good at throwing a bottleneck every now and then where you're basically surrounded and you have to go into... Um, you know, a bit of a kind of a gauntlet of, of, of trying to manage your ammo, manage your reloads, while also taking on everything at the same time from all directions. Uh, but no, yeah, ge- generally a, a solid uh, act um, of, of the, the main four. And to be honest, probably my favorite overall. Yeah, that's fair. I can, you guys have probably sold me on that. I think it's, it is possibly my favorite as well actually it's it's really really good that being said uh i do really like the mansion incident which is our next one of course the retelling of the resident evil remake um the side scenarios for this are nightmare which is sort of tracks rebecca's path between zero and re1 which is really nice and rebirth which also similarly nicely fits in a gap of Wesker waking up revived from his experimental T-virus dosage um, and leaving the mansion just before it explodes, uh, encountering Lisa Trevor along the way. Uh, and as I sort of referenced at the top of the show there, uh, taking her out with a chandelier of all things. Um, so those are two really cool little gaps to fill in. Um, how did we feel about the retelling of RE1? Uh, James, let's, let's start with you. What do you think of the mansion incident? Uh, I really liked the mansion incident. It was solidly put together. It was nice to see it from that first pers- third person perspective. Um, again, just like I've said before, mm. um, it was terrifying to see crimson heads for the first time because um, I've not actually played a game with the crimson heads. I don't think. <laughs> oh yeah, I did. I yeah, played you played remake. remake. Yeah. Um, but they, yeah, though, but... they, I mean, in this game, they really do come running at you, don't they? out of corners yeah. and stuff like that. I was like, and there's so many of them as well. Like, mm. I love that room where there's like one, and then it's like, oh, there's only one. Then there's two. <laughs> then there's five. Yeah. Then there's ten. You know, it's like ah, oh, there's so many. Um, but yeah, great. It looks great. Uh, was getting a was getting an RE4 vibe from the interior a little bit. Um, just the the like the yellow and green colors they were using. Mm. Um, you know, um, but uh, I have a I, I I was very sad to on this Lisa, Lisa Trevor thing. I made a tweet about it. I really hope that she's not dead. You know, and <laughs> you know, because I do not like off-screen deaths, and technically she did die off-screen. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and like, I just want her to be in the forest, you know, just having, just eating, you know, adult human being, beings, but being very kind to children lost in the woods, you know, <laughs> stealing the adults' faces to stick on hers. You know, I'm completely fine with that, right? Just, you know, she's just, you know, finding, letting kids, you know, find their way home. You know, Lisa in my book is alive and well, and she's a blessing to this series and should, has been squandered if she is dead. Um, yeah. There's a new head cannon for you. <laughs> I'm just picturing Lisa Trevor walking up to some like 16, 17 year old going, How old are you? <laughs> no, no. Are you she'll... lost or are you food? No, 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 no. She'll just know, okay? This is Resident <sighs> Evil. Chris has punched a boulder, okay? This, you know, it's fine, okay? She, she'll she see them, she'll know, I don't know how. Like... That's her superpower. Exactly. <clears throat> she, her superpower <clears throat> is knowing your age. <laughs> How many She's rings like do you have? Okay, that's how she knows <laughs> you're a tree. <laughs> anyway, I'll get off topic. Um, I just hope she's alive and she's having a good time um, <laughs> and doing doing what she's good at. Um, the the thing I really liked as well uh, about this section was the nightmare section. I did really like seeing yeah. that because I remember in me saying to Steve, I remember Steve answering me actually. Like I'm like, well, how this will happen? And Steve's like, go play your umbrella chronicles, mate. You know, and I'm like, okay. So then I did. That's my impression of Steve. So then I did, and uh, <laughs> so then I did, and I was, I was, you know, I was. It was nice. It was good. I liked it. I liked that that link being made. I love mm. Richard. Um, yeah, the voice direction might have been a bit wonky, but uh, the yawn fight was really difficult, uh, but just not quite difficult enough that it was just. Um, you know, sweat inducing. It was mm. it was pretty good, and I, I I like that. And the fact that Rebecca took charge as well, I really love that because like it kind of backs me up because I know that's what she's capable of. Yeah, right. Because yeah. she would not have gone to stars otherwise, right? And you see that uh, in the nightmare, uh, in the nightmare scenario. And I think that's all I got to say. Lisa Trevor forever. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm glad you said that. You know um, about nightmares. It's, it's it's a nice little chapter in in Rebecca's infrequent appearances. I, I agree. It's such a such a cool little idea to plug that gap a little bit as well. You know, obviously, it doesn't necessarily fix people's uh, issues with the fact that she has a slightly different personality in Remake and Zero, and obviously, she doesn't bring up those events. But it is nice to have a very visible through line from those two games mm. certainly and uh I, I, yeah i feel as i said i sort of feel the same about rebirth getting to play as wesker leaving the mansion before it explodes is uh is really cool and you know oh. whilst we talked about his performance being pretty pretty met like well maybe not his performance but his his voice direction and choice of voices is, is very meh um it is uh, kind of like cool to see dc douglas wesker um, sort of like the, the roots of it here, sort of connecting up what's going to become RE5 Wesker back to the beginning as well, which is nice. James, you just gasped. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I like, yeah, you just, I thought Rebirth was the next one for some reason. Yeah, that, um, that, that scene was awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, because I mean, that's been a, like a big black hole for me for such a long time, right? Totally. Like, and of course, and it was, was like, for everyone really up to this point. Yeah, and I was like, what is. How did he get out of there? This is such a huge plot hole, right? But then him, um, like, thanking... Uh, was he thanking Sergei at that point? He thanked Sergei, right? I think he did. And then he thanked Birkin. And then, he, like, he gets up because he's been... this. He's on, on his road to becoming a super soldier at this point. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love Rebirth as well. It was super cool to play him as well. Even yeah. though he did... It was very difficult for me to play him because I'm literally killing Lisa Trevor, Trevor at that <laughs> point, right? And I was so sad, like, doing it. I didn't want to do it. I was like, I kept on saying to the game, please don't make me do this. I don't want to do it. But it did, and then I felt <laughs> terrible. <laughs> this is what, what you were saying earlier about this game having some great cutscenes as well. Um, Rebirth's sort of opening cutscene where Whisk, Whisk, Whisker? Wesker gets back up um, and sort of smashes the sunglasses and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. I love that. Um, Jordan, what do you think of the retelling of Resident Evil 1 Mansion Incident? Well, this, this is the game that I was most familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of going into it, obviously it was, it was the main reason that I bought it, to be quite honest, to, to kind of go through uh, that scenario. And 
it's it is amazing to um kind of tread through that mansion not only a first person perspective but also at such pace yeah yeah ah none of these none of these doors are pesky doors are locked you know just blast on through um you know just shooting up all the lights and shooting off all the paintings it was a level of interaction and exploration that kind of <laughs> knocked me for six when i first played it because it's just like so weird it's like despite the fact that i'm actually on rails I feel like I have a degree of freedom I don't actually have in the in the main game mm. just because I can go everywhere so quickly in it. Uh, as well, because you know, it's it's a mansion. Uh actually going going through it on a on a rail shooter is, is fairly brisk. Um but the the shine kinda goes off with it a little bit the more time that I, I spent with it just because uh because I was more familiar with it. The, the visuals in some places are a little bit weaker mm-hmm. or, or not, a, not even necessarily weaker, just maybe not necessarily sort of doing the justice. Um, I said before about the color palette being a little too diminished uh, to really sell uh, a, a lot of the, uh, you know, wonderful environments that, you know, it, it should be sort of showcasing. Um, but overall it's a, you know, it's a, it's a decent, uh, you know, scenario. I think obviously most of these, they do follow the same kind of formula, um, you, you know, in terms of kind of you'll have a, you know, a slowdown, exploration, jump scare. Uh, then you'll be on a bit of more of an onslaught. You'll have aerial threats and then you get your bottlenecks. Um, so it, follow, it, it follows much the same. And because I was kind of playing these through sort of, you know, the, the chronological sort of fashion of the, the menu, um, kind of was more exposed to that initially when I was playing through train derailment uh, mm-hmm. so i could see a little bit more when i was when i was playing uh, mansion incident but but still uh, obviously it's just it's just super cool to be able to go through it and i think it's a fairly decent uh summary of the mansion incident i think it gets all of the key beats that it needs um and it, it adapts it pretty well yeah that I, I i agree with you i think this is the one that i was most excited to play and you're right it's it's strange because on the one hand, maybe I thought, oh, that's it. You know, we breezed right through that. But it is exactly what it needs to be for the style of game that it is and what it's going for. And so you can move on for sort of the second half of the game and stuff like that. And obviously you get to re-experience the area and the two side stories that it's got um, as a little package. It's, it's, it's very nice. Um, in terms of a retelling, um, I kind of agree but obviously there's one big oversight which is a big old missing character (laughs) you get chris and jill wandering about together which is nice actually kind of cool to see uh re1 which doesn't have a fixed canon um getting to see chris and jill just wander around the mansion together as the two playable characters and they get to bump into rebecca but a certain mr burton is just completely gone uh so as steve once famously put it um, on our Sherry Birkin episode, it was. Uh, this is definitely the Wesker retelling of the series of events where he hates Barry so much that he's written him out of the story. <laughs> because it's it's weird because, like, it's, it's right. He shouldn't be there, in a sense, because it's just going to slow down this light gun game, this on-rail series of events. He's actually kind of unnecessary for this version. But I will say, it's sad that he doesn't get to be there. It does feel like something's missing. Um, Steve, as you famously said that, how do you feel about Barry's exclusion? Do you, do you think it was probably the right move or, or is it just a just a bit of a stab in the heart? How do you feel about the it's mansion incident? Harsh. It's harsh. It's <laughs> harsh. Like, as much as like I love Richard and I really do think he's like, you know, he's got some of the standout scenes for me in this. Like... You know, it would have been nice to see Barry kicking about, even if it's just like Wesker's on one end of the phone going, you must do this malarkey or I'm going to kill your family. And then you get like an infinite ammo magnum with only six shots and a horrible reload time. You know, it would have been a fun time <laughs> blasting things with a magnum with infinite bullets, just saying. Um, I tend to look at this like the narrative, my general head canon rules when it comes to Umbrella Chronicles. I don't know if I've touched on this. Is generally, if it's a game that we can play... I don't really mind. You know, I'll, I'll take it as the, the, the non-canon remix. And, yeah, of uh, course. In that regard, I think it does really well. Like, it, it it's a it's a solid 5 out of... Well, 4.8 out of 5. The Plant 42 fight is complete dog droppings. But, you know, generally, it's a good time. I uh, the, the excising of Barry obviously hurts, but like people have already said, it's, 
you know, it makes sense for the sake of pacing and the fact that you don't need another single person scenario when you've got Wesker's story and you've got, you know, Rebecca's story. And let's be fair, Barry's story is entwined with Jill's campaign in the, right. in the actual full release. As much as it sucks, like, <laughs> not to be charged, but going through, these, going through the actual mansion itself, and I think you hit, like, you don't hit every room, but you hit a significant amount of it this time. And if you played the remake and have any time at all, you really get a feel for how these rooms look and see them in a 3D environment. It's fantastic. Uh, you even get a unique B.O.W. specific to the mansion incident in Umbrella Chronicles in the form of a giant sodding bee. Oh, yeah, it's that's crap. right. Yeah. But it's a, it's a unique yeah. boss. <laughs> but, yeah. oh, I say boss and lose his terms. You just lob mm. two grenades at him and walk away, Rebecca. Um, <laughs> yeah, fun times. Uh, the Aqua Ring. The, I, I was never, you know, I'm a retread. I didn't realize we actually go there. And uh, I was very impressed with how well the water actually looks. This is the sound so so old man, but it looks so good on a Wii. And mm. uh, you know, water is something the video games don't do very well. Just cause, just just saying, mm. you know, not not in them olden days, but when you know games had pixels. Wait, they still have pixels, Steve. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, leave, leave the old man alone. Um, music's great. Atmosphere's great. Pacing is completely wacky, but that's that's the nature of a rail shooter, isn't it? Of course. Um, I do think overall, it's it's like a, it's the gold standard for what Umbrella Chronicles sets out to be, though. And especially with the the sideways stories of Rebecca and Wesker themselves. And I think while Rebecca's story is a kind of like that could have been left on the cutting room floor, Wesker's was definitely a, a level of satisfaction seeing him actually get out of the mansion. Uh, as someone who doesn't really care for him much these days, back then, this set my eyes alight. This was amazing. Yes. Yeah, it is really cool. One gameplay aspect that we haven't actually mentioned that I just remembered, um, and it's it's fairly infrequent, um, but there are a couple of like multiple uh, route choices. Um, and the one that stood out the most to me is in Mansion Incident 2, so much so that I did play it through it twice, uh, just to go both ways to have a look where you can move towards the guardhouse, um, I guess, from the front, you know, and you go over the, the, the pond or whatever that is where it fills up with water and do all the crank and stuff. Um, or you can go in through the caves um, and go to where Black Tiger usually is and all the spider webs and then come up into the guardhouse that way. I thought that that was really cool. I was like, oh, I completed the first time. I was like, oh, I have to replay and see what's the other way. Maybe you even get a completely different boss. Of course you don't. Um, but it, do, it is cool to go on, on a different pathway and then rejoin at a later point. That was one of the standout route choices. It's only, is it one of the only scenarios that really does that? Like the rest just go like here's in a room for a few seconds or yeah, here's like a different it, alternate corridor. Been, yeah, exactly. I think there's a couple that, like you say, there's just a, a couple of different corridors in uh, the RE0 one. I don't think there's anything in RE3. And then the only on, one that stands out in Umbrella's End is that maze Near the uh, near the end, which doesn't mm. really count because it really is just one big room, and you're just sort of choosing how to navigate between these little blocks. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the big one in terms of choosing a route, as it were. Um, I'm really glad that we've been very positive about this game so far because obviously, look, you know, let's be honest, the last two podcasts we did have been pretty <laughs> negative, which is fairly unlike us. So I'm really glad we've been positive, which means we can now swing for the fences uh, with the Raccoon City destruction uh, scenario which includes uh, Death's Door, which is the Ada Wong scenario, which is nice. It's similar to Wesker getting out of the mansion. We get to see how Ada escapes Raccoon City before it gets destroyed. And I believe also when you unlock Fourth Survivor, it appears here as well, which is, as we know, a sort of, as yeah, Steve rightly put it, sort of like a remixed non-canon version of Hunk's Escape from the City as well. Um, Steve, I'm going to let you start off with Raccoon City Destruction. Was this a huge mistake? No, generously speaking, <laughs> as a, a retread of three outbreak scenarios with Nemesis on top, cool. As a, as a as a retread of Resident Evil Three, it is complete and utter uh, compound dog. Uh, Nemesis appears for all of what thirteen seconds. Uh, he is a slow, lumbering, boring brick wall that does nothing until his final boss fight, except occasionally shoot a few rockets. And otherwise, you're fighting hordes of zombies on the street, hordes of zombies in a subway station, and uh, yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it. To, in its credit, the, the second scenario, I think, controversially, 
is the best, where Jill and Carlos go through a train station and they fight a uh, absolute shadow of zombies on a train line in pitch darkness and then have a moderately tense battle against about 452 hunters. Otherwise, it's complete crap. It's, um, did the budget run out? Uh, I, 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 I'm stunned, really, because it literally is the opening outbreak scenario and then you've got the, I believe it's two maps from file two, you've got the RPD and then you've got the Jim's um, subway station. It's these didn't appear at all in 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 uh, well, no make mad also uh, very on the nose references to the films which you know gets a bit stronger in Umbrella's End but the, the, yeah no made, made me wince a little seeing Jill dual wield and then neck snap a zombie I know oh. we're not at that point in the series yet but yeah and and Carlos it, you know it's nice that you know he he has all the charm of a plank of wood. But he also has the world's longest melee attack, so I suppose it bounces out. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's as you said, it's 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 outbreak stuff, but with the Resident Evil Three title and characters in it, it's it's I don't I I don't oh I can't I'm just gonna say it as a written it this shouldn't have happened they shouldn't have done this you know. It, this is an insult to Resident Evil 3 and it's, e- it's 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 such an easy target to say all you people moaning about Remake 3 and how it didn't live up to what you wanted. Uh, well, it could be a lot worse, to just put it that way. Uh, all the people that want an outbreak, you know, a new game, uh, here's one, kind of. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's insulting that the first real location from Resident Evil 3 that you come across is the RPD and it's the last scenario and Nemesis doesn't show up till the last minute and then dies by falling off of a roof at the end. There's and no he's barely a threat. He's he, barely a threat he, the entire absolutely time. Absolutely not. He gets exactly in that scenario he shows up three times, basically from a distance every time. Uh, then you just yeah, he dies by falling off well, I guess he maybe he doesn't die by falling off the roof, but he gets blown up shortly after. So he's he's taken care of by uh, being dropped off a roof. It's oh god, it's yeah, it's Scenario one is like twenty minutes long, and it's basically just zombies, and nothing, nothing interesting happens. The grave digger was kind of cool, I guess. You know that that was something, or maybe I just thought that because I just already hated it by twenty minutes of nothing and zombies. Uh, Carlos's look is terrible, and he sounds incredibly generic. And okay, sure, I sort of understand. Original Carlos is kind of caricature-y, stereotype uh, Latino man. Uh, but this is just, yeah, completely whitewashed, boring, yeah, Chris Light or whatever. I, I don't know. It's so oh, bad. <laughs> just, uh, just cracking open a Chris Light with the boys. Know, Chris Light. <laughs> we don't do that. We stay far away from this Chris Light. I, yeah. And the dialogue I, I, is so bad. I'm sorry, I just have to call out the specific parts of the dialogue that are so bad. Uh, Carlos says at the beginning of Scenario 3 that the city's about to be bombed and then the, uh, five minutes later they're outside and Carlos goes, you should get take me on a tour of the city sometime. I don't know if they're trying to be sarcastic and fun, but it, it came across as stupid. Even worse when they get to the rooftop. The door opens, Nemesis is there and Jill says, it looks that way. And then Carlos says, he survived that? That was a clear oversight and mistake. Um... I, don't, I, I I hate it. I'm sorry, it's got no redeeming qualities. Uh, I, well, I, to reiterate, I still think Scenario 2 is the best one, even if it makes no sense. I agree pitch, with that. The pitch dark atmosphere and the boss fight against 400 million hunters is kind of cool. Yeah, it's fun. It's a fun setting. but it makes yeah. no sense in the game, It's like in the yeah. narrative, but outside of that, Absolutely. good gameplay sequence. Yeah, it is, is the one shining light in uh, Absolute turd to be honest but anyway that's my <laughs> that's my opinion of it uh jordan what do you think of raccoon city destruction as you said you played with a friend who loves re3 was were you both was he hugely disappointed by this i mean we you know we had fun with it because we you know playing together and it's kind of like you know he knew uh you know all of the sort of the, the plot and the locations and what have you but I, in 2007, had never played Resident Evil 3. Mm. Heard of it, seen it, but I'd never experienced it. So this was, in effect, my first impression uh, <laughs> of Resident Evil 3. And obviously, it's it's a pretty dismaying impression to have because it's not faithful to, you know, what the experience is supposed to be. And it's, uh, you know, just in it of itself, not very good. Um, 
yeah, I mean, there's there's not a lot to really kind of recall from this uh, entire act either. Um, that you know, Saving Grace is is definitely kind of more of the 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 cool look and tension added from you know the you know flashlight gameplay. Mm. Uh, but besides that, it just especially knowing more about uh, you know Resident Evil Three, you know since. And seeing, you know, all of the wonderful sort of, uh, you know, original backgrounds uh, from the game, it, it's just, it's frustrating and annoying that uh, so often Capcom have kind of got 3D Raccoon City wrong um, mm. and and really kind of undersell it uh, from from what it should be. I mean, in particular, this this game, which obviously it goes for, uh, you know, more gritty visuals, but you know, still you could you could color grade it and it would look a whole lot better, sure. But also, uh, everywhere just looks so dirty and abandoned, and you know, this is a city in the middle of sort of breaking down. It's not like it's been broken down for twenty years. Uh, you go through like the the police station, and it's just. It, it looks like it's been left there for you know, years. Uh, whereas, you know, you take sort of like Remake 2, uh, you know, when you go through the police station in Remake 2, uh, it still largely looks normal. A lot, a lot of the offices, you know, that haven't necessarily kind of been affected by, you know, the events that have transpired within, still look like they were otherwise, you know, operating on a, on a average daily basis kind of routine and it's only when you go into certain hallways that you see you know the exact carnage that's been you know transpiring that's just not felt here because everywhere feels like uh you know a haunted spooky abandoned place and i just feel like that doesn't really miss you know it doesn't really hit the mark um but yeah biggest insult is just how cruddy nemesis comes across <laughs> cruddy's I a mean, great word <laughs> he he waddles <laughs> He absolutely waddles in certain segments towards you. And it's just, you know, like, it was great back in the day because we were just laughing at it. We were just kind of like, oh, man, this is so bad. But it eventually gets to a point where it's like, no, but why is it so bad? It's like, it's like, come on. It's not like this has been outsourced, you know, far away from Capcom's grasp. Surely they know what Nemesis is supposed to be. He's one of the poster boys. He's meant to be terrifying. And he just wasn't. It, it looked like... It looked like the old SmackDown versus Raw games when you play Royal Rumble, and Big Show <laughs> is one of the entrants, and he waddles down uh, the ramp. That is what Nemesis looked like, and Nemesis should never look like Big Show waddling <laughs> to a Royal Rumble. I thought you were going to say he looks like a creator wrestler, but that's good. <laughs> I mean, you could pro you could probably put that waddle on a creator wrestler too, uh, but it yeah, it just ugh, like it it. it it doesn't work. I don't know what they were trying to do because it doesn't feel like it would take that much effort to make Nemesis quite, you know, menacing. Mm -hmm. Just needs to just needs to move slow, um, and then suddenly start scarily sprinting towards you. And they just they don't achieve that in this scenario. And yeah, definitely the definitely the stinker of the bunch. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad we all kind of like agree on that because I wasn't really sure how my uh, impressions are going to come across, but it seems you've like... come across mild mannered compared to me and Steve. <laughs> <laughs> James, how did you feel about the RE three retelling quote unquote that is Raccoon City destruction? I forgot Nemesis was in this. Yeah, I mean, I come, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I completely forgot uh, because I was having so much fun in the train section. <laughs> like, I mean. I know we want to like kind of draw on the negatives, and this is clearly the worst like part of the game, like overall. But like that, I really like the use of the flashlight in that train section. It really like instilled like the rest of the game was like it did feel very Resident Evil, and then suddenly change up. Mm. You know, pitch black around you. You had to use your gun to know where like where you're going or where things are. You just hear be hearing voices. This is very this is very simple but good use. Yeah, I completely um, agree. Of, of their environment. Um, but yeah, like Nemesis was... was The Nemesis fights just weren't fights, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they felt very... I know it's a, I know it's a rail shooter, but they felt railroaded. 
you know, like you, it didn't matter what you did, really. Yeah, you shoot it a few times and it's done. You know, it didn't feel like a, a boss fight. In fact, the Gravedigger felt way more. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Than Nemesis did, and that that fight, I didn't expect that to go. I was like, I think I said during my stream, I was like. Oh wow! They they put Grave Digger in this. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I kind of like Grave Digger. Like it's a solid Earthworm. fight, right? It's a good fight yeah. in comparison to Nemesis, uh, even though it's a bit cartoony. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was really cool, and it was tough, and it kind of gives you a. Again, I was talking about right at the beginning callback, but it gives you a, a mechanic like that you have to overcome that c comes in later, uh, like several mm -hmm. times, which is shooting the you know, the, the bricks out of the sky. Um, and they kind of build on that later on as well. Um, yeah, I really like Grave Digger, really like the train section, but the rest of it just felt like a slog. Yeah. It was it was a slog and it wasn't fun. Um, yeah, and in terms of, like, story, I have no idea what happened. Um, <laughs> I don't think there was I, one, so... Yeah, like, it, 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 they didn't try with this one. They didn't mm. try with it. Um, I really... I mean, are we allowed to get on that now, or are we going to talk about it in a second, like the, the Ada and Hugs? Oh, no, by all means, please bring us back up a bit. Yeah, yeah, because, like, Ada, I, again, with Steve, how does she... I mean, I, I would have liked to see how she survived that fall, right? But well, I, I sure. think they're going with the, the Leon, the, the image they show uh, in the Shinkira mm. artwork, which is fantastic. Most of it is in this game, by the way, mm. is uh, of the bit where she's been smashed into a panel in Leon B. So she didn't get through in a pit this time. She's got crushed through a computer screen and oh, bled out. Oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah, I'll back you up on that, by the way. The artwork, again, mentioned on my stream. Fantastic. I love the end cards yeah, that, they totally. all, that they had and the start cards. But yeah, I love that section and like knowing how she got a hook shot as well. That was super cool. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of look, hooking up there and how she got out. That was so important to me as well. I, I love that, um, that side of it. And seeing Ada as well... Um, I know, I, I know we see it in Remake 2. We do kind of see it in Remake, in, in RE2 as well. But seeing Ada not doing great was really good. Mm. Because, yes. like, normally she's so confident and, like, she knows, like, the next step she's doing. She, you know, she's, you know, but, yeah, it was nice seeing her injured in an injured state. And on top of that, I know this sounds like a small thing maybe, and, like, everybody, oh, of course we knew this, right? It was, it was great to hear Wesker say you betrayed me mm. right because i was never sure if she did right if she was just say if she was just helping leon or not right just out of a you know out of her own selfish heart right but him saying that you betrayed me confirmed that she actually did give a damn about leon and what was happening um and it, it made me connect to the character more yeah um, because like i I like Ada Wong, but she was female spy number one. You know, in she she wasn't like a big character for me, but like after that, I feel she she's a bigger character now for me. Um, yeah, and even though she said, "But I've got this," you know, it's like after he said that, I was like, "Okay, she's just doing this because she's trying to literally save her life," and she even questions it by going, "Well, if this happened because of T virus, what's going to happen with the G virus?" Mm -hmm. So she has like a she actually has a moral compass and it was nice to know that. Um I mean the hunk side of things, not much to say. Mm -hmm. Um it is just a rewrite of the fourth survivor mission. Um like it's 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 non canon, right? I think. Most like, pretty often. much, yeah. Any anything that would be a retelling of something from another game, I think you just treat this as non canon. Yeah. It, well, it, it, it's not dramatic because it's just a case of hunk gets out. That's yeah, all you need to know. That's pretty but, much it, yeah. But what you do see, guys, is his face, which, <laughs> you know, and it looks like Ethan. I'm just no. I'm kidding. No, I'm, I'm, no. kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it kind of looks like Ethan, but I said <laughs> But um, yeah, you do see his face, though, in the, in the reflection of the little canister thing. That was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, but other than that, it doesn't really add much more to the the, the story. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like an extra mode to give you yeah, to have totally. some fun with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the the standout for me was Death Door. Yeah, that, that's fair. I, I completely agree with you. You know, it's nice to see some 
extra personality traits of Ada that we don't get really to see anywhere else. And as you say, see her bandaged up and she even starts the scenario on low health, which is kind of cool. And yeah, just again, like like you said, as of someone who watched or played the games and then had that question of, well, how does she get out? Capcom clearly knew what the big questions were at this point, generally, and uh, thought, well, this is the perfect place to answer them, as, as we've mentioned with Rebecca and Wesker and Ada and stuff like that. So, yeah, props on that one, definitely. Um, let's close out then with Umbrella's End, which is the original scenario made for this game, um, which also comes with a Dark Legacy, which is Wesker's side of the story, um, set many years on from the Raccoon City incident, um, this is sort of perhaps, you know, this may be my, just, just my thought on it, but perhaps kind of a uh, an attempt at taking down, letting the player take down Umbrella, obviously being called Umbrella's End, rather than the stock market doing it, like at the entrance for uh, Resident Evil 4 in the intro. Um, so you get to do some more fighting of Umbrella in a secret lab in Russia, uh, I suppose one of the questions is, does it stick that landing? Does it feel like a, a grand ending to the Umbrella story? Um, for me, uh, I like the concept and the setting a lot, but I don't think it particularly feels rewarding. Um, it doesn't quite hit the mark, and it it just feels really weird after the sudden shift of RE4 that we're playing a game called Umbrella Chronicles three years later. Um going back to that well already and sort of adding to it. I'm I'm happy that it's a part of the canon. Um I do like its inclusion. Uh but it's it's a little bit it's a little bit of a weird one. Jordan, what do you think about Umbrella's end? Or I mean obviously it's uh it's something new and it's something different and uh and you know possibly a pull for for certain people Absolutely. You know, who are possibly interested in the games like oh well, you know this is Something new story none of us have seen mm. yeah absolutely as far as gameplay is concerned it's it's a bit of a sort of a medley as we've mentioned before with the with the enemy so that kind of brings it down a little bit but it right. is nice to be in a completely different environment um you know rather industrial environment far away from you know everything else that you know the series had been sort of associated with up until this point um so yeah in, in, in general it was all right but i mean uh, there were there were certain segments which um, I didn't necessarily get on with that well. I mean, uh, you know, I wasn't like the the best shot, but I did all right. And then like, I just felt like it was like, all right, you can choose between going through the onslaught of hunters, or you can go through the onslaught of the, the locusty things. And um, yeah, I had I didn't, I didn't have fun with either. I died a lot on both of those sort of segments, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 all right. I don't think it's necessarily as strong as Zero and One's mm -hmm. uh, chapters, but uh, it it still stood out and had more sort of redeemable aspects to it than Three's. Yeah, I think yeah, I, across the board, I would I pretty much agree with that. It's from a law standpoint, it's it's pretty wacky in general. Of course, you've we sort of touched on Sergei Vladimir, who is this over the top, silly, you know, classic Russian Soviet bad guy. Um, it's funny because obviously, I guess they were looking at like we're going to let the player play as Wesker, the series mainstay bad guy. Uh, people love him though, so we need someone who's clearly more evil. So. Let's just draft up this giant Russian dude with one eye who likes to cut his own fingers and sort of lick the blood off of them. It's like, <laughs> how over the top sort of Bond villain do you need to go? Um, the enemy inclusions generally don't make sense. You know, Chimera is all the way out in Russia all these years later doesn't really make sense. And Eliminators, which weren't used by Umbrella, they were tested on. They were like, well, they're not very good. Uh, apparently, someone disagreed because of all these years later, they were cultivating them all the way over in Russia. So it's, it's a bit odd. Um, but it's you're right. In terms of a change of setting, it, it's nice. It's called cool to play as Chris and Jill at this sort of time in their lives as well, post-Stars and sort of just, just pre-BSAA. Um, as Steve sort of mentioned, uh, the umbrella, the uh, the Anderson references 
are thick on this one i suppose you can definitely have a split opinion about sort of inclusions like the red queen and and stuff like that which become canon obviously they're different to what they are in the films but uh clearly capcom were sort of high on the reaction to the first film or two which is why you've got the red queen and the the laser hallway which Never fails to, I don't know, put my head in my hands or, or give me a sort of dejected sigh. <laughs> there you go. Um, James, how do you feel about Umbrella's End? I liked it. Good. Um, I liked... I I know this sounds strange. I liked the Red Queen edition. Mm-hmm. But it's simply because I love... As much as it is, I love it for what it is. I do like the first Resident Evil movie. And I love the idea of an AI being in control of all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, like, because that's very telling of our future, just in the real world, like an AI doing all this. Like, Sergei is only pretty much, uh, the way I looked at him was that he was basically just an employee. You know? It yeah, been to a nice, certain extent, yeah. It, yeah, it would have been nice to get, like, a little bit more information on the Red Queen and what she was capable of. Because I... I like you i kind of separate those two things like i saw red queen mm-hmm. in umbrella chronicles as a completely different red queen as the one in the movies right it totally is yeah yeah and like i, I think they were they were trying to portray that while also writing they did it quite well while also writing the high of the movies and yeah that was the laser, laser corridor which yeah i love a good laser corridor me <laughs> um yeah i thought it was well paced out and i like mm-hmm. the the different choices you had to make as well I, d- I don't know if they actually ever amount to anything but the the choices you make while going through the prison cells and stuff um or whatever they were um going to the computer room yeah they were pretty they were pretty cool um yeah and i feel i feel you as well the monster design <laughs> having you know enemies that have literally been frozen to be in siberia you know out here you know and they're fine you know that's 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 not jamming and james as well that shouldn't work um <laughs> you know so i but i kind of just ignored that because i like the section um itself um this <laughs> but the bit i didn't like and i think everybody knows and i might get some backup on this is um the the two ivan fight was mm-hmm. so difficult mm-hmm. um and to back it it up a little bit i am playing on a 22 inch monitor and these games are typically meant to be played on like a tv um so that might have been it but i was having such a rough time just aiming for the ivans like in any way shape or form to the point that i had to actually look up what happened after Mm -hmm. because i just couldn't kill these two it was just impossible for me um yeah, the, the much more skilled people um, have done it, um, so I know it is possible. I was also <laughs> playing on easy, judge me. Um, but yeah, I, I liked it. I liked, like knowing that it wasn't something boring, like a stock crash that did it. Um, yeah. I also loved that you see Oswell, like, in this final scene. Mm. Like, in, well, not in the final scene, but you see it just at the end of the... of. Um, of Ada's, uh, of Ada's campaign, uh, in the helicopter, and you see him in the Umbrella's End as well. And so, though he's credited as just unknown employee. Yeah, I think obviously with this one, it's it's kind of what you sort of interpret it as. Um, there's a lot of different opinions about who that be, and Sp- Spencer is definitely one of them. Um, or you know, there are some theories that they were setting up another character and it never came to fruition and that kind of thing. So it's so the whatever, you, dirt. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want to head canon it as, really, to be honest. I mean, I mean, just I mean, going by their own canon, like Resident Evil Five, he's li- that's literally what he looks like. Sure, you know how his whole posture is and how he's sitting and like he's always got a rebreather on, you know. So in my, I mean, in James's headcanon, it makes sense mm-hmm. to connect these two people up. So I'm 100% certain that's Oswell uh, getting out of there. Um, yeah, and I, I like Sergey. He's he's very cartoony villain, <laughs> but I love that. Um, I also, you know, again, biased because Russian accent. Um, <laughs> and also, like, the Talos fight was great. Um, yeah, even it took me, it actually killed me three times. Um, nice. but 
I really felt like I was learning something. This was, by the way, this side and everyone else, this is when um, my hand was really starting to hurt. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, no, I want to kill this boss. <laughs> I want to kill this boss because he's so cool. Right, he's like, and we were talking about like fighting a big ape at some point, and he kind of looked like one, mm. and the way he like kind of went around and did things, even though he was a slash tyrant. And then there was Sergey himself, who I feel like um, was a little bit of an afterthought. He, I'm not sure what the design was, like what their idea was behind the design was, but he looked like he was handcuffed and then turned into a tongue with teeth, <laughs> and like it, it was a weird design. Completely weird design. Mm. I didn't. I didn't quite understand it. Mm. And there was, unless I read the law documents, which I haven't gotten around to, I don't know why he turned into that because he just randomly turns into it. So if somebody, if somebody wants to enlighten me, I'm, I I'm, think he has just infected himself with the T virus off screen, and then somehow magically just sort of triggers the mutation when he feels like it. It doesn't really make much sense, to be honest. Oh, okay. I think, I think he just comes down to that. Um, yeah, do you know, I. I will say that I don't overly like some of the the new designs like the Vladimir fight and uh, the Ivan Tyrants and stuff like that. I had the same issue you did. Um, you know, hands up, I didn't finish this replay for the podcast. So I got tired doing the, the two Ivan fight and just sort of gave in. But I did flip over to my, as I mentioned, 25-hour playthrough. 25 hours in and we didn't beat Dark Legacy Part 2. So those those final bosses are uh, no joke for sure. Um, so there you go. There, there that is. But of course I have looked at the ending as well, like you mentioned. Um, yeah, do you know, as I sort of I do, turn my nose up at some of the, the, the movie references, um, I do like the... Uh, UMF, you know, this mainframe of data that gets moved from Arclay all the way to here at the Wesker comes in and takes, which feeds, again, like the little side stories we talked about, filling in gaps, it just sort of feeds into the larger narrative that Wesker winds up selling this information on to uh, basically give himself immunity from what's happened, discredit Umbrella and just shut them down like politically speaking, uh, that that computer and, and its data is essentially what seals their fate and gets them closed down for good. Um, so in that in that way it is umbrellas end. Uh, Steve, it, how do you feel? Oh, sorry, go sorry, on. sorry. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, just a small detail. It was n also nice to see a connection. I love connections, guys. If you haven't guessed already, uh, it was really nice to see a connection with Wesker at the end of this and at the beginning. Oh well, the Wesker we see in RE4. Yes, like, yes, totally. Because we, we see him in RE4, he's in his chair, he's got like, seems like he's in a mastermind like room, like cerebro like room. And mm. yeah, we, we got a glimpse of that in this game, and that was really cool. Definitely. This game sort of, yeah, bridges the gap between classic Wesker and the Wesker to come from, from four and five, certainly. Uh, yeah, Steve, what are your thoughts on Umbrella's End? Okay, this one. Uh, mm. Uh, if, there's, if there is an average by the numbers feeling thing, it's strangely this one for me. And despite the fact it's the first stage, if you're not counting bonus stages, where you fight IVs and mm. you have the ever so fantastic Talos, which goes from looking like this really awesome gorilla tyrant with a rocket launcher to a giant blob monster with tentacles that shoots blood lasers, uh, <laughs> which is an interesting spectacle in the Resident Evil universe, blood lasers. And, you know, I, I think the thing that gets on my nerves is this This has got such a uh, a weird fascination with the movies to the point where we've got, there's at least a handful of uh, references that, that in, the, in the security room you see a few like screens most of them are flashing red with like warning but mm. there's like clearly a layout of the hive from mm. the movies uh, then you've got the laser corridor which I think this, this punctuates this entire bit they walk in they do a QTE dodging lasers they can't even get through the door at the other end and then they walk out. <laughs> what? Why was that even there? Uh, I, I, not, not to be petulant. Uh, it's okay. But I, I, part of me still wonders why, even after playing the, every scenario, how did the outbreak even start? Like, yeah, there there's, a the law files? Uh, there's a comic book that goes into it, to be honest. Uh, like it's not it's not a Vincent Goldman situation, is it? Where uh, I accidentally did something silly, I best kill everyone in the nearest vicinity. I like, can't you know, it's, remember what the law reason is. 
Let me see if I can find it. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not saying Sergey comes across as a bit of a mad one, and but he does, and I get the real the feeling he would kill everyone in his base just for the sake of someone like spilt some pen on his paperwork. <laughs> he he doesn't seem all that stable. Um, the master plan and the super weapon are okay. They're not exactly what I would like to see as the zenith of the tyrant program. Mm. I'm going to be honest. And Sergey's final form is a bondage tyrant. That's new. Um, no, <laughs> I, I don't know. You see, that's the thing. This one, it's it's got don't a lot kink of cons- shame. I can kink shame Sergey. He's crap. <laughs> um, <laughs> like it's the boss fights. Like excluding the double Ivan fight, are boring. Like they have like a big spectacle to them, but there's not much to them. They're very simple, especially in comparison to what's come before. And then there's the double tyrant. Ivan fight, which is like if you haven't got a machine gun with a thousand bullets or you know some kind of super super perfect aiming, you're gonna get rinsed repeatedly and it takes the fun out of it. The actual settings themselves, I swear you've taken the the uh, the island from RE4 and you just put snow textures over the top. Mm-hmm. I got yeah, and then mm-hmm. there's the monsters that shouldn't even be here angle. It kind of draws me out. I get the idea. I, you know, the music's you know it's got the epic like final boss theme as the start. From RE Zero, and you know, I get it's going for some kind of epic showdown, but there is no history between right. Jill, Chris, and Sergey. You know, and, and Wesker doesn't really even speak to them. They're, they're not going after him. They're going after this random Russian bloke who only says one word to them. They kill Talos, and then they leave. It it's fun as a sequence, but it just feels a little rings hollow. Yeah, if that makes any sense. Um, to the point where the gameplay is serviceable. The it's, atmosphere they're going for is okay, but there's a lot of stuff that's just needless. I'm going to be honest, and obviously this is not the game's fault or anything like it, um, but if this concept of the Russian laboratory and the outbreak and Chris and Jill and Wesker in the background again, and they really wanted to do uh, almost like a zero adding information in after the fact with Sergey and stuff and all the files... Uh, if this was a full game without asset reuse, without movie references and stuff like that, if they really wanted to add this part to the canon, it, it probably would have be- worked better as a sort of standalone thing. But because of the nature of it being a chapter in a light gun shooter, you're right, there is far less sort of weight to characters and character interaction because they've never been in anything before. They try their best, and that's fair enough, but I think just the context of what it's in uh, Calling it the end of Umbrella just feels like they're just giving it a fancy title to try and and, and uh, give it the value that it, it wants to have, but it yeah. doesn't. It's just they they go to Russia, they kill some bloke, West can nick some stuff. The end. Yeah. Like uh, the stock market was more of a fatal blow, apparently. Mm-hmm. If this had been the final, the true final showdown with Umbrella that they've been building towards since RE2, RE3, and Code Veronica. This might have been like even worse for some people. <laughs> I feel like right. Okay, uh. well, we've been going quite a while, so let's keep our conclusions brief. I think on Umbrella Chronicles, I think overall we've all had a good time with it. I know I have. Uh, it's been nice to revisit. I haven't really played it since those twenty-five hours when it came out. So yeah, it's, it's been good fun. Issues with the RE three chapter and uh, Umbrella's end not being quite as good as I'd like it to be, but still being kind of fun in its own way. Aside, yeah, it's, it's good fun. It's easy to pick up. It plays really well for, as Jordan has pointed out, um, developers who haven't had too much experience with the genre and Resident Evil stepping into something on rails for the first time. Uh, it, it does enough to separate itself from other games. Uh it's not something I don't think that many people go back to all that often, but if you do, it's a fun time, I suppose, is my uh, my final look at it. Uh, James, this was one of your few experiences with the genre. It sounds like you had a good time with it. Yeah, I had a great time. It was, it's a fun game. Like I, I'm not gonna take it away, take any like points away from like it's like it's fun capacity to be fun because it mm, is fun, of course, and it like. And they know they know that when they were making this, they knew what they were doing. Like when it came to a rail shooter, other than that Ivan fight, like I don't <laughs> I don't know what they were yeah. doing there. But um, I also feel like I was in disadvantaged as well, like just with my setup and stuff. So um, I feel like if I had the proper setup, I would probably have had a better time with that fight. But yeah, 
it's a great game and you know everyone should i think everyone should have played you know if you you are a resident evil fan you should play it like for sure because mm-hmm. it's got a lot of information and in if you're interested in the lore or even if you're interested in the small little links between stuff for umbrella sure. chronicles fixes those things up and i'm excited to also play dark side at some point mm-hmm. um, as well in the future yeah, I think Umbrella Chronicles' sort of big legacy is sort of its additional scenarios that fill in the gaps and stuff like that, um, which is which is cool, definitely. Steve, final thoughts on Umcron? Uh, it starts out very strong, and the the middle chapters will either infuriate or just be a bit lackluster, but that doesn't mean it's not a bad time. Uh, graphically, it's a fantastic love letter to what has come before. The audio, I think, is undersold, and I would recommend listening to in a vacuum, if not during the game and adjust the volume levels accordingly. Uh, Character portrayals are hit and miss, but the ones that you don't see very often tend to get more screen time. Uh, The principal main villain is completely needless, in my opinion. I would have just had Wesker versus the Red Queen. I don't think I actually said that, have I? I thought I should. Mm. Uh, But generally speaking, it may well be the second best of the light gun shooter games available from the franchise. (laughs) And the sheer weight of stuff you can do, the fact that there is uh, different loadouts and strategies give it a lot of replay value. So in that regard, Mm. it gets a thumbs up from me. There's just a lot of things that make me mad about it. Plus the whole, if you're a law buff, there's a lot to chew on here. Yeah, Uh, sure. And that is probably why a lot of people listen to these podcasts. I think I know we're not the law buffs of the Resident Evil community, but yay, there's a lot to have. Uh, so yeah, overall, eh, it's, it's a four out of five. Just don't look at the RE3 bit too hard and Umbrella's <laughs> End might give you a bit of a coronary if you're me. <laughs> Jordan, final thoughts on Umbrella Chronicles? Uh, yeah, very fun little package. Uh, I thought it was, you know, a nice, a nice spin-off for Resident Evil to have. I mean, uh, if I have my way, like, Every game series would have some kind of rail <laughs> shooter spin-off that sums up, uh, you know, all of the different campaigns that you might have had throughout the game history. Um, I think it does a, a great job in terms of uh, the content that it provides. Uh, you know, this is a short format kind of game uh, that's meant to be played in bursts, and not only does it offer those in in those bursts. It offers quite a few, so you can always yeah. kind of like revisit different seg- segments. There's a lot of emphasis on replayability for unlockables and extra tuning to your weapons and stuff like that. It seems like the developers uh, really actually took the time to uh, understand what they could do in terms of uh, a home rail shooter experience, and I think they nailed it for the most part. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there are a, a number of issues to do with how some of the scenarios are actually portrayed compared to their original games um, that do leave a bit of a bad taste but overall as far as you know the actual games design is concerned uh, the success is far outweigh the failures and I think it still holds up uh, despite the fact that it is a rail shooter with motion controls from 14 years ago <laughs> uh, despite that if you can play this, and there's obviously there's only certain ways that you can play this ultimately, but if you can, uh, and you're a fan of Resident Evil, especially of, uh, you know, these games covered, you know, Zero and One, um, don't try it if you like Three, um, <laughs> it's it's worth checking out. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's... Um... Let's hope that something like the House of the Dead remake, just to to reference it one more time as we tie it up, does really well on Switch because uh, who knows, maybe these games will get revived and uh, ported over to the Switch or something because as you say, it's 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 the Wii or the PS3 uh, these live on at the moment um, unless you can figure out an alternative. So it would be cool to see them ported over to something like the Switch. But you're absolutely right. You know, if you if you if you've got an itch for some Resident Evil, but you don't necessarily want the investment of uh, a full scenario, a full you know full fat horror game or whatever, and and you, and even if you're not sure which one you want to play, if you feel like playing Zero, RE One, and Resident Evil Outbreak, uh, you can get all that uh, in Umbrella Chronicles at a nice quick pace, just a little bite sized replay revisit of those scenarios. Well, nothing else remains for me but to thank our contributors. If you'd like to be part of the show, then please look into auditioning for our file readings. 
Join the Discord server to get in touch with members of the team and our community. Discuss Resident Evil with us and other fans and listen to the podcast live as it's recorded. You can find a link to the server as well as our Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram, YouTube and more at fasprayPod.com. You can find the podcast on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify and iTunes. And if you enjoyed the show, please do leave us a review where you can. It helps spread the word. You can also support the show by picking up some merch or at patreon.com forward slash fasprayPod for as little as one one dollar a month in our next episode we look at another retelling of jill's last escape hopefully a more fulfilling and accurate one as we bust out our copies of resident evil 3 the board game in a post delivered <laughs> kickstarter edition and pre-retail release podcast uh, our thoughts and some q a with of course our friend and the developer of the game show in matthews thank you to the panel you can follow all of the pueblo people individually i'm at Siniac underscore one two three steve that fb steve was taken jordan is at serial box 64 and james is at moist owlet off and finally thank you for listening and have a good week And it amazed me that it was cheaper for me to uh, send a T-shirt to her in Canada than it was for me to get one here. It cost me seven pounds to get from Germany to the UK, but it only cost four dollars to get it from wherever the factory is in America to where she was. And I was like, oh, oh. OK. Yeah, there's a big old B word is the reason why. <laughs> <laughs> but right. Has anyone, <laughs> has anyone so got bees? But it's bees. Like it gets carried bees. by bees. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because those damn expensive German bees. Right. <laughs> That's where they've all disappeared. They're all working in logistics. Female spy. <laughs> <laughs>